Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. Today we're thrilled to be joined by the BNPL market leaders of Zipco to shed some light on the space for us. Please welcome Dr. Tommy Memelstein, Chief Strategy Officer. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, and have a great day, and thanks for, for having me today. Well, welcome to the show. Now, first of all, a congratulations is in order for your exceptional uh, financial year 21 results and a transformational 12-month period. Has it been all smooth sailing for Zipco? Uh, you know, the business has been around for eight years. I've been with the business for five, and it feels like we're, we're just getting started. It has been a, a massive year for us over the last 12 months, well over... 100% year-over-year growth. We've done a number of acquisition and organic new market entries, you know, Middle East. We recently announced South Africa and an investment in India. Um, took, took the keys of the U.S. business and rebranded them from QuadPay to Zip. And all in the time of COVID, you know, through Zoom and, and distributed teams. So it's been a very busy 12 months, um, but we're very excited about the, the next 12 months as well. And that's incredible to hear. So would you say that COVID has been more of an opportunity rather than a speed bump for you? I think we've been, um, you know, besides for the human toll and, you know, a huge amount of mental health issues and um, there's been significant economic um, sort of costs. Net, net though, Zip as a business has been a beneficiary. And I think that's because one is we're a technology business and we've always had the ability to work remotely with distributed teams. Um, I think it's fundamentally changed how consumers um, transact and make purchases. So the growth of e-commerce where the lion's share of our business, in particular in markets like the US has been growing uh, very strong. And then, you know, the government support has helped, um, you know, the consumer. So, you know, savings rates, and um, you know the, the repayment profiles of our customers are looking extremely healthy. Um, so net net, we've probably done okay out of it, um, but it is a challenge, you know, uh, working from home, lockdowns, all, all the stress that comes from us, and then you have to continue to sort of make sure your your credit models are, are appropriately timed as stimulus potentially comes off and things are, are rapidly evolving. Well, I don't doubt that. And it's uh, safe to say that it seems like you've come out on top with that. So that's very good indeed. Now, you mentioned your expansion to international markets. So just to touch on your recent strategic investment in uh, Zest Money, the BNPL player, how would you say this bolsters Zipco's global presence? So we, we see a truly um, an opportunity to create a global powerhouse. Um, and there are very few players right now that can offer up the number of markets and the diversity of markets, both across developed and emerging markets, uh, 
that's similar to Zip's footprint. And that's because we think the opportunity is, is massive as consumers, not only in countries like Australia and the US, move to point of sale finance and interest free installments, but in emerging markets like India, where affordability is a real challenge, access to traditional credit with like bureau files, um, you know, it, it is truly challenging. And, if, you know, if you take a step back and you look at India as a market, it has very strong payment infrastructure with UPI. It's got a very large and growing middle class and consumerism is, is on the up. Um, e-commerce growth is, you know, one of the fastest growing e-commerce markets globally. So the size of the prize there is, is very large. Um, and if it felt like when we think about our global aspirations and our mission and our purpose, it's in a market that over time we definitely want to have a footprint in. It made sense to back a local team. So we did a lot of work. Um, who are the players locally? What is the market going to look like over the coming years? What are the different product offerings and the regulatory requirements to actually have an installment offering? Um, we've been quite friendly with the Zest Money team for some time. It's nice that their name starts with a Z as well. Um, and so we've been following their story, and it, you know uh, we're, we're very excited to partner with them. Uh, Peter Gray, our uh, one of our co-founders will be joining their board and we think we have a lot of value to deliver to them and vice versa um, you know we're learning continuing to learn about the market uh, it, it's very exciting we think some of the learnings that we have uh, will be very relevant for them but ultimately we're also seeing a lot of latent demand in our merchant network for um, exposure to emerging markets and india is, is up there on the list so you know just after the announcement the number of inbound from merchants and also payment processors and PSP and other types of partners around. Can we also look at expanding the relationship to India is, is already um, coming through? That's great to hear. It sounds like a very promising partnership indeed. Now you mentioned as well your expansion to the South African market, I believe. Could you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So um, there's a the number one player in South Africa is a business called Payflex. When we acquired PartPay more than three years ago, it actually came with an equity interest in PayFlex, and we got to know that business um, over the last three years. So our day one, once we acquired a business, looks very different when you've, when you've known the founding team and you've been sharing insights and technology for the, for the last three years. Um, and uh, a number of weeks ago, we announced the, the full acquisition of that business. Uh, it just made sense to bring it in house right now. Um, we're looking forward to completing that transaction over the coming months and welcoming the Border Payflex team into the business. They are clearly the market leader. And one of the things we really like about that business is the alignment of culture. And it's actually one of the markets that has the lowest um, bad debt rates. So they're, they're, their unique decisioning technology very much aligned with us around the ethos of financial responsibility. Their product set is quite interesting. And um, it's another important addition to the border group. That's incredible. It sounds like it's a, a very good match for you indeed, a match made in heaven there. Are there any other, uh, other sorry, international markets that pique your interest? Well, we have a, um, uh, we announced also the entry into the Middle East, the, the GCC region through the acquisition of Spotty. Um, that again, e-commerce, you know, double digit e-commerce growth, a very strong founding team, the coalition of founders, and we've been doing a lot of work with the broader platform in the region. Um, and we'll have some exciting news around that opportunity in due course, seeing very strong growth there. Um, starting to make uh, expansion plans into the, the EU, um, again, off the back of the Twisto investment. And recently we launched in Mexico and Canada organically. And it's really the ability to offer all those markets through a single integration and a single merchant interface. That is, that is you know, the merchant promise. Um, and that's what we're delivering to market. And we recently announced, you know, a very large retail in the likes of Sheen. Uh, and what we've been able to do and, and negotiate with them is to launch across all 12 markets through that single integration point. Um, and that's re really an amazing outcome for both our, our business, but also the merchant to be able to service them and support them across all those different regions. Absolutely, yes. and uh, Sheen is incredibly popular at the moment and will likely continue to be, but it seems like you've got a really strong reach on virtually every continent on earth. So that's great to hear on your end. 
Yeah, I think we've been very thoughtful. Um, you know, the, the focus is still the core markets and the majority of our capital and our focus does go to the U.S. and, and to ANZ, where we have a, a very large and substantial business. Our view is the cost to enter these markets will only increase over time. Um, the ability to find the right founding teams and boots on the ground. And because we have this truly global platform that we can, over time, replatform these businesses and for, and at different speeds, um, really is part of our competitive advantages when we think about what differentiates us from our, our global peers. And if we just fast forward over the next two to three years, we think you know these, these businesses, these new operations will deliver substantial free cash flows and ultimately enterprise value and, and shareholder returns. All right, definitely. Very well said there. And speaking of competition, it's actually obviously no surprise that the BNPL space has had very heated competition in recent months, which I'm sure you're aware of. And uh, Zipco founder has officially welcomed this, Peter Gray. Would you say, considering this, that the competition has proven itself to be to the company's benefit thus far? I think competition is healthy. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing how much headlines buy now, pay later grabs, given how small we still are in the grand scheme of things, you know, in terms of the amount of uh, payment processing we do versus traditional credit cards and, and the likes. But I think what's happened is there's been a recognition of what the longer term opportunity is as consumers globally shift away from old school credit products and into simple interest free installments. And, you know, Players like PayPal and some of the others that you know are, are starting to move into the space. I think they help demonstrate that you know the opportunity is large, um, and we're all uh, we're all able to enjoy the growth of the addressable market as it continues to expand. I think for Zip, it also opens up a range of new strategic partnerships. So players that probably have discounted the space in the past are finally waking up and thinking about you know buy build partner and looking at partnership opportunities with market leaders, uh, and there's only a handful of them out there. So we, we do see a, a number of really exciting partnerships evolving, given the competition and the excitement within the space. Well, that's certainly good to hear and like, uh, sounding like it'll work in your favor, definitely in the long run as well. Now, we know that uh, you have several exciting new developments in the works of Zipco. What can you tell us about the rationale behind, for example, the move to offer physical cards and crypto payments? For sure. So I guess, um, you know, our broader strategy is we're longer term, you know, developing a broader digital wallet and payment offerings. What we're trying to do is address the consumer's pain points around payments. And if you think about our, our, our mission to be the first payment choice everywhere and every day, it really speaks to a much broader offering and developing this deep engagement with our customer base. So through the trusted relationship around credit, we can move into other adjacent services. In the U.S., for example, though, you know, you know, paying with uh, mobile wallets and, and phones, Apple Pay and Google Pay, isn't as prevalent given the, the physical card readers just don't, don't enable that and consumers haven't nearly adopted the tap and go mentality that we have here in Australia. So the physical card in the U.S. will be really important as we continue to sort of take advantage of the in-store opportunity, which is really large and underdeveloped in the market like the U.S. So physical card in the U.S. is, is very high priority for us. We did a pilot and we had some very strong uptake and increase in transaction frequency. Um, and just having the physical card in a wallet gives you sort of that mind share, where in Australia that's, that's clearly not required. So, th so that's a, a very exciting initiative for the U.S. in particular. And then uh, more generally, when you start thinking about crypto and rewards, again, it's about building out the use cases. And we speak to our customers to try to understand what they're looking for and what they're looking for from Zip specifically and what we have the right to play in. And crypto, again, is a natural extension um, where customers are looking to to get in and you know we, we, we can enable that through some of the rewards offerings and some of the broader digital wallet capabilities and that's another uh, feature set we look to launch first in the US um, but then look at other markets where it's uh, applicable as well. well. It's really good to hear it sounds like you're definitely staying on top of the game and evolving with the times there especially with the introduction of the crypto payments um, but I actually took a guess that the introduction of physical cards was something that would definitely benefit the older range of your consumers who are definitely used to that that kind of medium. Is that the case? Um, it's it really starting in the U.S. not necessarily going to help us target a different age demographic. It's more about that in-store opportunity um, and in reality, just there are many places in the U.S. 
where you can pay with Apple Pay or Google. It's just the, the card readers aren't as advanced. And consumers haven't, even the younger demographics, just haven't adopted uh, the digital wallet payments as fast as we have in, in some markets like like Australia or even Southeast Asia. So that was the primary primary sort of driver behind that. Um, but it all speaks to the longer term strategy. We're trying to develop a very strong uh, uh, deeper payments experience and, and the increased engagement with our customer base. So other payment use cases, and again, physical card in some markets is, is a relevant uh, requirement. All right, certainly very interesting and important to have that variety there as well in terms of payment options. Now, just before we wrap up, what can you tell us about what's on the horizon for Zipco in the near term? And potentially, do you have any predictions as to how the BNPL space will play out in financial year 22? Well, I'll speak to Zip first, and then we can talk about sort of how the market shakes up for competition. For us, continued focus on consumer and merchant. So, uh, we're very focused on expanding the product set. We're relevant with both our consumer base and also developing a range of new services and products for our merchants so that we become more important to them and, and stay ahead of the competition in essence. So one is the, the expansion to continue to focus on our core set. So we still see a huge opportunity um, to grow the customer base, to grow the, the merchant network in the markets we play in, and then expand over time. The, the second focus for us is we, we have made a number of strategic investments and bets. Um, it, it's time to demonstrate the growth from those green sheets. Um, so we're really excited that over the next couple months we'll start announcing and sharing more around how some of these new market expansion activities are actually shaping up and some of the flywheel merchants that, that, that we have in the pipeline that will, you know, help us scale in those markets extremely quickly. And the third focus is just on the people on the team. So, you know, um, in times of COVID, globally distributed team, uh, globalization, making sure we have the right people in the right places, we continue to support our talent, our Zipsters is, is also always gonna be a continued focus. Um, we're at well over a thousand people now and we have still very strong growth aspirations and we need to make sure that the zip culture, the zip, you know, the way we work, our focus on innovation, on product and technology continues uh, to stay ahead of the curve. In terms of the market, I'd say there will be um, more interesting deals as the market continues to evolve. I think that the space will remain competitive, but in a good way. Um, and I, I'd also see you'll start to see players, you know, expand from pure play, buy now, pay later. You know, that's a great opening wedge to build a customer related range of products and services in the financial space. So you start seeing some players probably, you know, do more on the consumer side of the equation. Some players might start differentiating by developing more services around the platform from a merchant interface perspective. And I think you'll see more segment specific players that are really going to go and stay very focused, but can build, you know, serious and sustainable businesses around specific ecosystems. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of potential growth for all of us, and I think uh, you know we'll continue to take market share away from from the old school dinosaurs. <laughs> no doubt, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and how the space evolves as well. And it sounds like you've got quite a lot of growth still left ahead of you to go. So we look forward to seeing that in the near term and future as well. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me today. Thanks for joining us. Yes, on that note, it is just about all we have time for today. Um, folks, thanks for joining us. And if you missed this episode, you can catch it later today. We've had a great discussion with Mr. Tommy uh, Stain of Zipco as well. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkine TV for more live updates. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. 
The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Men of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Crypto is in overdrive. Gravi Token, for example, has risen by an incredible 11 million percent in a matter of months. Bitcoin is on the cusp of a bull run, and new NFTs and DeFi protocols are being established every day. In short, there's a lot to take in. One of the best ways to do so, though, believe it or not, is via Twitter. There's a number of personalities and platform related accounts that provide important information and can help you to read the cues from the crypto world. And in this video, I'll run you through the top 20 that you must be following. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Okay, let's start with the elephant in the room. Elon Musk, with the handle of at Elon Musk. Elon Musk, the outspoken Tesla CEO, has the power to move markets with a single tweet. Unfortunately, his meme posting has also caused plenty of crypto crashes. Off the platform, he can be even more damaging, as his Dogecoin inspired appearance on Saturday Night Live proved. Whale Alert, with the handle at whale underscore alert. Amassing 1.5 million followers since its launch in 2018, Whale Alert is a prolific account that features the most advanced blockchain tracker and analytics system reporting large and interesting transactions as they happen in real time. By keeping tabs on Whale Alert, investors can gain an understanding of trends emerging in the market. They also alert investors of potential scams, which is of course really useful. Andreas M. Antonopoulos, with the handle A-A-N-T-O-N-O-P. Andreas M. Antonopoulos is almost as synonymous with Bitcoin as the name Satoshi Nakamoto, and he's been promoting the crypto for nearly as long. He's been teaching the world about the power of Bitcoin since he first understood its value himself around a decade ago, and still he provides some incredible updates. Willy Wu with the handle at Woonomic. Willy Wu specializes in Bitcoin's blockchain. Wu looks at all kinds of blockchain data, such as the total wallets holding BTC and how much BTC each of them holds. PrimeXBT with the handle at PrimeXBT. The company has exceptional engagement with its audience. The Twitter account is also an extension of its 24-7 customer service and the account regularly gives away Bitcoin, trading tips and much more. Lolly with the handle at TryLolly. Lolly gives away Bitcoin to users via Twitter using something called a Satstag. In addition, they partner with retailers to offer Bitcoin back on purchases made through select partners. Peter Schiff with the handle at Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff is actually a Bitcoin hater and naysayer, and he's an outspoken gold bug. So why is he worth following? Well, his tweets often correlate with huge shifts in the market. After all, Schiff famously predicted the GFC well before it hit, so he knows a thing or two about markets, and when he tweets, the masses listen. That includes those in the world of crypto. Spencer Schiff, with the handle at Spencer K. Schiff. Spencer Schiff is the son of Peter Schiff, and they tend to feed off one another due to the fact that Spencer is an early Bitcoin supporter who bought the cryptocurrency when it was below the $20,000 US mark. It's somewhat of a sore point with Father Peter, who has bashed the decision publicly several times, but as it stands, Spencer is having the last laugh. Michael Saylor, with the handle Michael underscore Saylor. Michael Saylor is another CEO turned Bitcoin influencer, who bought into crypto back when the cryptocurrency was priced at around $12,000 per coin. With Bitcoin currently sitting above 40 k he's continued to espouse the positives of cryptocurrency. 
Tyler Winklevoss with the handle at Tyler. Tyler Winklevoss is notably the more aggressive investor of the twins and the more outspoken one when it comes to crypto. The twins' early investment in Bitcoin led to the pair of them appearing on a number of world's richest lists when Bitcoin enjoyed an enormous boom a few years ago. Cameron Winklevoss with the handle at Cameron. Cameron is also a great follow for industry commentary and expertise on the crypto market. Like the combination of Peter and Spencer Schiff, you don't quite get the full picture without following both accounts and making sure that you've got both twins on your profile. Charles Edwards with the handle at Capriliello. Charles Edwards is known for developing some of the most unique cryptocurrency analyst tools. For example, the hash ribbons combine Bitcoin fundamentals with BTC USD technical signals. Philip Swift with the handle at Positive Crypto. While Edwards is known for his buy signals, Swift is more known for sell signals. Swift's most popular tool is the Pi Cycle Top Indicator. Mr. Whale with the handle Crypto Whale. It's the social media extension of www.cryptowhale.org. Crypto Whale has been involved in crypto since 2013, and amongst investors, it's regarded as one of the best accounts for information, and the Crypto Whale team has been ranked as the top Bitcoin writer on Medium. They also provide a newsletter which has 130,000 plus subscribers. Now whilst these are the major ones to be across, some other notable mentions include Plan B with the handle at 100 trillion USD, the creator of the Bitcoin stock to flow model. Vitalik Buterin with the handle of the same name who is the founder of Ethereum. Barry Silbert with the handle of the same name, the creator of Digital Currency Group. Coinbase with the handle of the same name is one of the most famous crypto exchanges. On Twitter, they frequently do coin giveaways for various cryptocurrencies. Peter Brandt with the handle at Peter L. Brandt. This is the account of the renowned commodities and futures trader. He tweets his insights into various markets from chart readings, crypto and otherwise. John Bollinger with the handle of B Bands is the inventor of the Bollinger Bands. Bollinger Bands are a type of statistical chart characterizing the prices and volatility over time of a financial instrument or commodity. And lastly, as an added bonus, it's also worth following Mike McGlone with the handle Mike McGlone 11. He's the senior commodity strategist for Bloomberg, and as the title suggests, he has some extremely valuable insight. So there you have it, 21 of the best accounts relating to crypto to follow to ensure that you can invest wisely in the rapidly growing crypto market. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment about what other crypto-related information you'd like us to break down. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. The cryptocurrency world of late has made investors take notice of a new phenomenon called non-fungible tokens or NFTs. The explosion of NFTs in 2021 represents a new realm for digital assets. With NFTs, they've now entered domains such as arts, games and personal collectibles like e-trading cards. The newest kid on the block is called CryptoZoo. CryptoZoo is a Binance Smart Chain NFT project launched by YouTuber Logan Paul. 
CryptoZoo is the second foray into the crypto space for Paul, having allegedly been previously involved with Dink Doink. With CryptoZoo, holders can breed, collect and trade exotic hybrid animals, which are actually the NFTs. CryptoZoo aims to allow users to create hybrid NFT animals, which the user can then hold or trade to yield tokens and in return, earn a profit. CryptoZoo is governed by its native token Zoo, and will need wrapped ether, also known as WETH, to purchase NFT eggs. With WETH, the users can breed the new animals on the protocol. So why is CryptoZoo unique? CryptoZoo already has 5,000 holders, and the users can create their version of hybrid animals such as Penguin Shark and Panda Cat. In order to buy Zoo, the users will have to first download the Trust Wallet app, following which they can then purchase Binance Coin. With its unique NFT model, holders also stand a chance to earn exclusive reward points. The zoo's vibrant ecosystem is largely community driven and derives its value from there. CryptoZoo aims to combine the proven success of gamified animal ownership along with anticipatory optimism to collect trading cards. The idea behind CryptoZoo was to bridge the gap between NFTs and tokens, and honestly, it actually does a pretty good job of doing so. Is it a good investment option? CryptoZoo is ranked at 2,826th on CoinMarketCap. Zoo currently has a fully diluted live market cap of around 337 million US dollars. The Zoo token, however, has courted some controversy, mainly due to its delayed launch and with others doubting the feasibility of it in the long run. Investors believe that Zoo is best to make profit in the short term, and as it's already seen a bearish run since its launch, the customer confidence is yet to settle in. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share and subscribe to the channel, and of course leave us a comment about what other crypto related information you'd like us to break down. And don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Kalkine TV Sydney Studios. Australian shares are said to open higher this morning. They've been tracking Wall Street as investors grow more optimistic that U.S. Congress could reach a deal to avert a government debt default, with soaring energy prices likely benefiting local energy firms. The local share price index futures rose 0.4 percent, a 2.5 point premium to the underlying S&P SX200 index at the close. The benchmark closed 0.6 percent lower yesterday. The Australian share market fell for a second day, giving back early gains following continued declines across Asia and signs of a sluggish start to U.S. trade. The ASX 200 fell 0.58%. Local shares kicked off the session in positive territory, lifting by as much as 0.4%. Um, markets have been lacking enthusiasm since hitting record highs in August. U.S. share markets climbed yesterday. That's as investors grew optimistic about a U.S. debt ceiling deal. U.S. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell offered a short-term suspension of the debt ceiling to avert a national default expected on October the 18th. Stocks fell earlier in the session after strong September private sector jobs data fueled bets. The U.S. Federal Reserve could start relining the monetary stimulus soon. 
Shares of Microsoft rose by 1.5%. Amazon shares gained 1.3%. But Moderna shares dropped 8.9%. That's after the Swedish and Danish authorities paused COVID-19 inoculations of younger people. That's because of cardiovascular concerns. The Dow Jones index rose by 0.3% after dropping 459 points at the session lows. The S&P 500 index gained 0.4% and the Nasdaq index added 68 points or 0.5%. Back home in local news, Borrell complete the Meridian Brick joint venture sale to Weinerberger. They today announced the completion of the sale of its 50% owned Meridian Brick business to North America Weinerberger for 250 million US dollars, with Borrell's share being 125 million US dollars. Proceeds from the divestment will add to surplus capital from other recent divestments. Burrell is seeking shareholder approval at the annual general meeting on the 28th of October to return up to $3 billion of surplus capital to shareholders by way of an equal capital reduction. And that is subject to shareholder approval and an appropriate class ruling from the Australian Taxation Office. Moving on, buy now, pay smarter company OpenPay has entered into a 271.4 million US dollar asset-backed revolving debt facility with Goldman Sachs and mezzanine financing provided by Atalaya Capital Management. The warehouse facility will enable OpenPay to fuel its expansion into the US with the transaction representing a key milestone for OpenPay as it looks to facilitate transactions for merchants and consumers in America and lays the groundwork to support growth in the region. And the main pharma group has received a complete response letter from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in relation to its abbreviated new drug application for a generic version of Nuvaringo. Main Pharma is working closely with its development partner, Mithra Pharmaceuticals, and the FDA to address the questions raised. Following submission of the response, Main Pharma will receive a new target action date from the FDA. Main Pharma CEO Scott Richards says the market opportunity continues to be attractive, with two independent generics approved and an addressable market of 670 million US dollars. Well, now it's time for a very short break, but stay tuned. I'll be back with more. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. And welcome back. You're watching the Morning Outlook Report on Calkine TV. In U.S. economic data now, private sector payrolls, as reported by ADP, increased by 568,000 in September. MBA mortgage applications fell by 6.9% last week. European share markets fell yesterday. The pan-European stock 600 index closed down by 1%. As soaring oil and gas prices intensified concerns, inflation will dent economic growth. The German DAX index fell by 1.5%. Germany's factory orders slumped by 7.7% in August, the biggest drop in 30 years. Over in the UK, the FTSE index lost 1.2% with London-listed shares in Rio Tinto and BHP both lower. U.S. Treasury yields were mixed yesterday as investors digested the better-than-expected jobs report and U.S. debt ceiling negotiations. Major currencies were mixed against the U.S. dollar in European and U.S. trade. The euro was near $1.15 at the U.S. close. The Aussie dollar was near 72.75 U.S. cents at the U.S. close. The Japanese yen was near 111.4 at the U.S. close. Global oil prices retreated from multi-year highs yesterday. This was due to an unexpected lift in U.S. crude stockpiles. 
U.S. crude inventories rose by 2.3 million barrels last week, and that was against expectations for a modest dip of 418,000 barrels, according to the U.S. Energy Department. The Brent crude price fell by 1.8 percent to $81.08 a barrel, and the U.S. Nomex crude price lost 1.9 percent, down from seven-year highs. Base metal prices were mostly lower yesterday as concerns over China's troubled property sector, higher inflation and global growth outweighed a better-than-expected U.S. jobs report. Copper fell by 1.4 percent with zinc 1 percent lower. Tin lifted 0.2 percent and the gold futures price rose 0.1 percent. Spot gold was trading near 1,764 U.S. dollars an ounce. Iron ore was unchanged at $117.80 an ounce with China on holiday from October the 1st to the 7th. Well, that's all from our Morning Outlook report here on Calkine TV today. Have a great day trading, and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph, sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Priya Mishra. She is CEO of Corporality Global, a marketing and management consulting firm with expertise in offering high-end marketing solutions across various industries. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello there, Priya. Welcome back to Calkine. Hello. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you. Good to speak to you today. So let's talk about how Corporality helps its clients strengthen their objectives and increase their brand's visibility. Yeah, so I mean, as we have been discussing earlier as well, that we are the company is actually very focused on people's future uh, visibility. So we are a very brand positioning company, not the brand uh, lead generation company. So the way we focus, we create the customer experience, we create the marketing with the consistent intended maturation model, and we implement into the system. So the system is so culturally conditioned. Uh, it can talk about the more future with the present and we increase visibility in the longer game. And Priya, could you tell me about some of the high quality solutions that Corporality offers? We are offering um, digital media marketing. So the way we work, we work in a very packaged way. We believe that uh, doing bits and pieces is not going to work. So we are very much omni effect company so we create a if omni effect that and we have phases to achieve the goal and the vision the client wants to achieve so the way we work we actually package if you want to go in a very digitalized transformation we work on a whole digital media strategy and we choose the tools and and the process which is needed to take you to the place where you want to work to go with your vision so we are very focused on the strategic aspect and can I ask, how does the Corporality Effect program assist its clients with digital sales? See, the, the way, it, the more visibility you have these days, everybody knows that, you know, you can't hide behind the curtain. You have to have the visibility. You have to have the brand positioning. You have to create a perception where you want to see your client um, is vis visualizing you and your service. 
the customer experience is very focused for us and once we start giving that customer experience they, they become your evangelist they start talking about you and once they the your customer starts talking about you we can be, work on a more sustainable model and when we design our next level first is in your first years of your service we talk about more customer um, your corporality effect we try to reach out to the larger audience with the very consistent communication and narrative um, and we create the omni effect in that sense that where everybody uh, should start hearing the same communication and the perception you want to create once you would achieve that we go to the next level and we talk about how you're going to target your current plan and the future plan together you know if you want to be somewhere three years down the line and five years down the line you have to start planning now you have to act now you know um, we are in a fast growing industry and you know majority of businesses are very competitive so we have to be very active and Priya, would you like to talk about the package service offerings by corporality <coughs> Yeah, so our services are like, uh, you know, we offer um, corporality effect, which is like a digital media marketing. Then we offer another service, which is marketing strategy for 2022 to next financial year. So each year people start working six to seven months before so that they can, they can plan ahead for next financial year. We also offer the customer experience service, um, you know, which is, I'm, we are kind of your outsource CMO, or you can call us outsource uh, CXO. Um, if you look at the CXO services, like in 2017 to 2021, the 35% increment in the people in the larger businesses started hiring more customer experience officer rather than customer marketing officer. And I would like to uh, differentiate what is the difference between customer marketing office, chief marketing officer and chief experience officer is that chief marketing officer is very much your marketing. So it's more out, outside experience. When it comes to the CXO, the CXO has to look after your inside and outside both. Mm -hmm. So you, we, the way we offer the employee experience, your stakeholder experience, your partnership experience, and also your, of course, your customer experience does matter, yeah. And you did mention the grand omni effect. Um, can you talk in more detail about its success? What is so important about the grand omni effect? So the reason why I'm very particular about, about it, because the, unless you are visible everywhere together, you are lost, lost in the crowd. So we all know that digital is actually playing a bigger role in marketing these days. And when you look at the digital media platform, just different tools, whatever you are trying to use and achieve, it's very, very noisy place. So unless you go with the you know, grand effect and if you can give the same experience and same message on a different place, it's not going to give you the effect you are looking for. So you can't just choose one platform and say, oh, I'm doing marketing. It's like kind of, a you know, uh, it, it will not be very effective for you because your majority of crowds are actually seeing your um, messages on the different pl platform on a di different time zone. And so as, as you go, the more platform, the more places, the more visibility you can create, the more noise you can create, the, in, that's where your actual effect you can see and the vision you can achieve in the longer go, game, time, you know. Exactly. And, and could you please tell us about the shared value you build with the Stakeholders Benefit Society with the corporate citizenship expansion feature? Yes, yeah, so I am always a big believer of giving back to the society. So I always believe in co corporate social responsibility and we have done an initiative. Every per income we are getting, 1% income will be going to my charity work, you know. And uh, in fact, we go ever and beyond during this, in this COVID time, we try to help a couple of old age uh, homes um, in India because they're, they're, they have dementia and all they've lost their home, they don't know where to go. So we help th those houses to, you know, food, shelter, medicine, whatever it is needed. We also help people uh, from the orphanage. We just initiated a youth program um, and the program was initiated for a very small group, but now it's literally going, it's, it's nearly 2,000 members now 
from India uh, student group and the group is from 15 years to 25 underprivileged students who don't have the edu you do who has the proper education but they don't know what's what to do with that so what we are trying to uh, bring the concept of becoming entrepreneur if job job opportunities are not there or the dream work is not there why can't we create that and i have seen during the covid time that there was a huge migration from village to the city metro cities was happening and it affects the lifestyle the humanitarian ground of lifestyle you know the basic standards we not followed because of the lack of money and the earning they do in the metro city and the cost living cost is very high and i'm encouraging people if you stay in village and you can live better life with a better income why would you not so we, we are trying to educate youth and to make better use of their education and uh, leverage what they have it sounds very charitable some of the work you're doing there and what are corporality's plans to advance in the marketing space for the future see well, we are very big believer of having a sustainable business model right there are a lot of businesses are just surviving you know and they are surviving because they have lack of uh, you know system futuristic approach um, they have lack of strategy and planning and if they have you know a lot of people plan and the execution is a biggest challenge and there is a, a huge gap we can see between the in, in management and the employee the management is you know i mean it's their baby they they actually start with a very huge you know vision and they they pushing it pushing it hard working day night but then the employees are not clear enough what they are supposed to be doing or if they are they are just following the instructions and all so what i'm trying to say fill that gap using my cxo um, process fill that gap they, let's work the vision together because it's an, it's like an army right so it's like if you're going on a war foot you can't go win the um, you know whole war by yourself you need an army your team is your asset so it has to be you know Together, the culture should be like togetherness. The, the, they should live your vision, uh, what you want to achieve, where you want to go. They should support that that process so that it, your life will be much easier. So I'm helping businesses to become create more sustainable model, right? Rather than going behind the short term flashy outcomes. Sounds fantastic. And just finally, Pray, congratulations on the launch of your book called Journey of Perseverance. Could you Thank just you. briefly tell me what you would like the reader to take away from your book? See, this is a kind. This is the my book. Uh, it's just a look I would like to give, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, journey I have been through and how I achieve what I achieve. A major role in my life in my achievements is my perseverance. I was very persever perseverant in every pro everything I thought of. I had a zeal, I have a passion, I, and I was very perseverant about it. So I felt like I should share my story. And this is a bit of a story and my achievements, how I achieve, and we brought some case studies in that for the you know successful people. So this is an inspira inspiring trip towards the you know change adoptions, you know, the success we achieved with the time and this is this is the story of the people who can actually who wants to go through the the journey i have been through and the others also um and you can achieve what you want to achieve if you will be following the certain rules and the process of yourself that sounds amazing and congratulations once again on the launch thank of your you. book with that prayer i will say goodbye but thank you so much for your time today Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank okay. you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector.
Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Yeah. I'm your host, Sage. And in today's show, we have a special guest, Mr. Tom Lipsinski, co-founder and CEO of Veply. He will share valuable insights in operating a unique HR tech startup. And Vply is a web application that allows candidates to apply for jobs with a video profile. Finding a job is challenging and Vply allows job seekers to make an impactful first impressions. As you know, they last a lifetime. And so applicants are able to create a short video instead of just sending their traditional CV and cover letter. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market. And very lucky to share some space today with Mr. Tom Lipsinski. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. Big fan. And I hope I'm getting close to your name, getting correct. Is that sounding... You are very, very <laughs> close. It's, uh, it's definitely a pass mark. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we're keen to share your insights on the show. The employment sector has been in the spotlight during this downturn and we'd love to hear how your unique startup is helping people to gain employment. So, Tom, how has the recruitment industry responded to the concept of video applications instead of traditional CVs? Yeah, look, I, I think to start off, obviously, you know, 2020 has been a very disruptive year for many people, many sectors, and HR is no different. Um, so I think what, what started off very quickly is the adoption of video interview platforms. Um, so obviously, you know, you start off with a job search on the traditional job board, but then you sort of progress to a video interview platform. So Reply is one step before that. What we do is we actually allow job seekers to apply with a 30 seconds to, you know, to 60 second video. And quite quickly, we have actually grown to, to list over 30,000 jobs on our platform. And we have 20,000 job seekers basically putting their hands up saying, I'd love to be employed by your company. Uh, so yeah, we have a community of job seekers on Vipply right now, you know, looking for jobs from Christmas casuals to, to accountant and, you know, senior executives. So um, yeah, it's been quite a, um, quite a natural, I guess, progression from the adoption of video in the last couple of years. Absolutely. We couldn't have really survived or made it through the pandemic downturn and social distancing and working from home without video conferencing and even attending medical appointments and things like that. And so why not Absolutely. use this same technology for applying for jobs? It seems that we're definitely scaling that way. And Vapply is able to ensure that they're constantly innovating to stay ahead of the curve every step of the way. How do you ensure this is possible? Yeah, I think in terms of innovation, again, we, we are quite different from traditional job boards. And I think one focus that we have is putting job seekers first. I think we're very conscious of how difficult it's been over the last couple of years uh, for job seekers to apply for jobs, you know, with, with so many disruptions in terms of industry shutting down, opening up. And uh, so, yeah, we, we really want to make the job search as enjoyable as possible. I guess looking for work is never uh, enjoyable, but uh, yeah, we want to focus on if a job seeker applies for a job, how can we make it fun and sort of interactive? So, you know, we've developed things such as speech to text technology. Um, again, so that part would actually be quite interesting to hiring managers when people, you know, say a lot of interesting things about themselves, their achievements, whether it's academic or career uh, achievements or unique facts about themselves, all of that would be. Um, I guess browsable or available for hiring managers to grasp and 
I guess, collate and, you know, make the rights uh, higher. Exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And now with the easing of restrictions set to occur very soon in Australia, um, I guess more people will be out there looking for work, more shops will be opening up again. So this app, your application, will hopefully be put to good use. And I've heard the Tech Council of Australia is looking to fill one million tech jobs by 2025. So that your... Um, in a very good space there and hopefully we are able to create Absolutely. those jobs for those tech grads and you've created a revolution for the recruitment industry and please give your expert views on how job seekers and companies can build their brands through vply please yeah, absolutely. So firstly, yeah, I guess in terms of uh, things opening up, 100%. So we're in a great spot to, you know, a lot of people would be looking for work now. They're in, you know, it's been quite difficult and, uh, to look for work with so much uncertainty. But as things start to open up and restrictions are easing, uh, yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot more activity on our site and people are uh, just, yeah, I think the shackles are off and people are starting to, to look around and you know even look in different locations where traditionally they've been obviously stuck within the uh, their own little community so I guess you know when we talk about personal brands it's, it's super important for us so what we're encouraging for employers to do is to you know because we're video friendly we're encouraging employers to post as much video content about them as possible again just focusing on the job seeker what would be interesting to a job seeker is I guess to have a virtual walk around the office. Um, who are you sitting next to? What does it look like? Um, so yeah, we're encouraging employers to post such contents to give job seekers the best, I guess, overall opinion on what it would be like to work at this company. Um, so yeah, personal brands and you know company brands and emphasis on brand in general, yeah, very very important. And uh, yeah, video will help with that. Yes, it's amazing how much data a video can actually relay. It's so important for people to know what they're getting into for employers and job seekers, you know, vice versa. And I suppose it saves the employers a lot of time as well, being able to um, screen interviewees quickly um, with video Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of, one of the benefits of Apply is that you can make a decision much quicker, right, instead of cycling through thousands of CVs. Uh, you can you know, within a 30 second or 60 seconds uh, video, you can make a pretty quick decision in terms of uh, would that individual fit our culture, you know, um, are the qualifications real, is that, um, you know, is the passion really there? So yeah, we're not excluding CVs, I, I definitely understand the importance of CVs and cover letters, however, yeah, you can get quite a lot of information from a, from a 30 second video even. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing your passion for your project. Uh, it's definitely inspiring to talk to the business leaders who are inventing these innovations that are so important during this time of social distancing. It's become quite a cold place, the world, and we're not allowed to talk to each other, you know, uh, and we hardly see each other. And, and these video applications, I think, really do personalise the process. So with per personalising content and making it more interactive, um, how do these videos address the lack of human connection as well in, as part of the first stage of the hiring process? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, I've been a job seeker. All of us have looked for, for work at one point in time or the other. Uh, so I think one, one thing I've always found is how easy it is to apply for, for jobs, right? You get, um, you know, various sort of content, job boards, emails coming through. With one click, you can just apply for 20 jobs in a five minute train journey. So I think that disconnect from, are you really invested in that job? Are you passionate about it? Um, it it's kind of gone and it's, it's quite a lot of, I guess, desirable employers are getting so many applications and job seekers don't even remember applying for them. So for us, um, you know, we're re really looking at videos in terms of, you know, to do a video, you have to be passionate. You have to focus on a specific employer. You have to talk about yourself. Um, you have to talk about your achievements and, you know, unique facts about you. So I think we are bringing that humanity back. And when it comes to the actual real interview, it, it becomes a lot more memorable and enjoyable both for the job seeker and the hiring manager. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely think having that video component brings 
element of humanity and that human connection back. Exactly, and that is so important, especially in your space of HR. You really want to get to know what a person's goals are, what their aspirations are, what they've got to offer, and how they fit the position that you're trying to fill. And the HR industry is also being affected by technological developments as you are bringing into the space. In the short term, how do you plan to pursue more technological innovation? And what's the latest subject in your research and development area? Yeah, look, we've got quite a lot, but I'll cover a couple that are, I guess, um, the most relevant and the ones that we are working on. So I did touch on that browsable job seeker library. So whatever people say, you can search for it. Someone has done a Byron Bay triathlon. Um, someone can actually search for Byron Bay Triathlon and find that job seeker. So it's quite a unique feature where people can talk about themselves and be quite open and at the same time be, you know, uh, more searchable or have certain tags or keywords that um, would be quite of quite a lot of interest to certain employers. Uh, but yeah, we are working on things such as light and sound, obviously. This is a very good example, right, to make sure that you can hear me properly, the light's good, you know, the, the contrast is good enough. So basic things like that to even calculating how quickly you speak. So if you speak quite quickly, um, you could be a stockbroker, right? Um, or if you have a really slow, calm and soothing voice, maybe you're more suited to a storyteller. Obviously, I'm generalizing here, but having a word per minute counter would be quite a lot of interest to certain industries. Um, I've been approached by, for example, partially partially blind community of how frustrating it is for them to use CVs and cover letters to find work and, you know, once one spelling mistake and obviously they disqualified altogether from uh, seeking a great employer because of certain bots um, deleting their CV. So how can we be of use to partially blind community? Um, and another one, just lastly, unconscious bias. That's always a big one when it comes to videos. So for certain employers, they use audio only at the very beginning. So yeah, we have um, certain sort of um, tools where you can hide the video initially. You can even hide the name initially and just listen to the audio or just, just see the transcript. And later on, if you're happy with that, um, open up the video and uh, yeah, additional sort of names and so on. So yeah, very big on, I guess, unconscious bias when it comes to video, just to make sure that everyone gets a fair go. Fantastic. Well, sounds like a great innovation and best of luck with your near term goals, Tom. Thanks so much for making time for the show today. Thanks again. Appreciate it. And if you've just joined us, viewers, we had a very inspiring discussion with Mr. Tom Lipsinski, the co-founder and CEO of Vply. The full interview will be available at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel, so please check it out. But stay watching Kalkine TV for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic. Today we're bringing you the five best crypto debit cards available in the UK. So what is a crypto debit card? Cryptocurrency debit cards, just like a traditional card, debit or credit, is a form of a card which allows you to complete the transaction, but this time using Bitcoin, Ethereum or any other form of cryptocurrency. The crypto card is available in both a physical and a virtual form.
With a crypto debit card, one doesn't have to worry about whether your traditional debit card will be accepted by the merchant or not. It can be used in multiple locations which accept crypto debit cards and eases the transaction for the customers. As the UK is one of the progressive countries where crypto cards and crypto transactions take place in various stores, let's look at the top five crypto debit cards that investors can consider. eToro Money Card eToro Money Card is overall considered to be one of the best crypto debit cards operating in the UK. And primarily operating as a brokerage firm UK, it is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority or FCA. It's issued by Visa and directly connects to the main account. And through this, one can easily access the funds without having to withdraw it. The eToro Money Card gives the freedom for anyone to access their cryptocurrency and complete the transaction. Now besides this, one can also save 0.5% FX fee, which other providers charge at the time of transaction. Crypto Pay. The CryptoPay debit card is ideal for larger purchases. It was founded in 2013 and CryptoPay allows you to buy, sell and trade crypto assets and it is priced in Great Britain pounds. Issued by Visa, the CryptoPay debit card covers online purchases, in-store transactions as well as allows ATM withdrawals. Binance Visa Card Backed by Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance Visa Card is ideal for cashbacks. With the Binance Visa Card, you also get a chance to be associated with the exchange and can trade cryptocurrencies at just 0.10% commission per slide. With the Binance Debit Card, one can shop at an array of retail shops or withdraw funds from ATMs around the world. Coinbase Crypto Debit Card. Another Visa issued card which has a low issuance value of £4.95 and no transaction fee is charged on the domestic transactions with the Coinbase Crypto Debit Card. Any domestic withdrawals which are more than £200 is charged 1% fee while the international withdrawals are charged 2%. The Coinbase Crypto Debit Card is issued by Paysafe and has a top-notch security feature which is similar to that of the Coinbase Cryptocurrency Exchange. Revolut Debit Cards The Revolut Debit Cards are for those who are completely new to Bitcoin debit cards market. Revolut mobile app gives access to a wide variety of banking services courtesy of a unique account number and sort code and the Revolut app allows users to invest in digital currencies from within its app. However, the users will not be able to withdraw the crypto assets out and this has been considered as one of the drawbacks. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe to the channel and if you press the bell icon, you'll be notified whenever Calkine has a new video. But for more information, regular updates, do head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. And my name is Sage for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Malcolm Hevelwhite. He's the CEO of Atmo Biosciences. Now Atmo is a digital health business commercializing a world first ingestible gas sensing capsule. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Very excited to chat with you today, Malcolm. Welcome. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. Now, first off, could we get you to give us an introduction to Atmo and tell us more about what you are doing in the digital health arena? Certainly. So, um, look, we're a, a digital health company commercialising some technology involving a gas sensing capsule, which uh, you ingest and which senses gaseous biomarkers that are clinically important and transmits that information wirelessly to the cloud for aggregation and analysis. So it's to be used to analyze gut health and dysfunction. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Now you have been successful in raising almost $10 million. What are your plans for this raise? Yeah, so we're, we're very excited to have on board as shareholders as part of that raise, uh, among others, Otsuka Pharmaceutical, and Allium Capital um, here in Sydney. So we're really excited at how the demand that we experienced during that raise and the, um, the reception that we got from both existing shareholders and from new investors such as Otsuka. We've developed what is now the third generation of the capsule technology and we're involved in 11 clinical trials which are either underway or that we have completed. And we've administered the capsule now to almost 300 subjects in those trials. So it's certainly more than an idea. We're gathering a lot of valuable data. And this raise will enable us to complete the product development in preparation for a pivotal trial next year and make a regulatory submission with the FDA for a first indication. So it, it also allows us to continue our clinical program and explore additional clinical indications in commercially interesting applications like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which is the largest chronic condition that's treated in the US at the moment, for instance, and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which affects anywhere from five to 15% of the general population. And along the way, we'll be obtaining quality accreditation to the appropriate medical device level, um, along with automating and scaling up our manufacturing capability and growing our team to support those kinds of additional activities. Excellent. And Prime Minister Scott Morrison also marvelled at Amo's lab in a pill on his manufacturing tour in Melbourne back in July. Um, are you able to tell us a bit more about how the pill actually works? Certainly. So um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Morrison did enjoy his, uh, his visit to us. I think he was quite, uh, quite fascinated by what we're doing. But the, the microbiome, for those of you who aren't aware, is the collection of all of the microbiota that live on and within us. And there's a lot of them. They outnumber the cells in our body. They weigh a couple of kilograms and they play very important roles in various um, physiological processes. And it's largely an unexplored area and many aspects of the microbiome are a mystery. And your gut is essentially a, a nine meter long tube connecting different organs. Um, and it's very difficult to get into the inner reaches of it. So much less to understand what is going on functionally in there. And our technology opens up a window and shines a light on the microbiome function, providing insight by measuring these clinically important gaseous biomarkers to better understand gut health or dysfunction. And that's going to lead to earlier relief of symptoms, more personalized approach to therapy, and ultimately healthcare cost savings. And given that one in five of us are going to see a gastroenterologist at some point in our lives, there is an enormous unmet clinical need that needs to be met here because there's a lack of tools that are available for gastroenterologists to demystify what is going on in the gut. And we see enormous potential for this to become and ubiquitous as a first line screening and diagnostic tool to provide functional insight into microbiome function. 
It does sound so very futuristic. What are the future prospects that you have for this pill? Look, um, there are a range of applications, um, all of which result in data that are, are transmitted to the cloud and build a large data set. As I mentioned before, we've got um, over almost 300 subjects and their data from the clinical trials that we're currently running. But what that allows us to do by building a data set like that is to overlay algorithms and apply machine learning and AI to the data to extract additional insight about an individual or a cohort and the state of their gut health or, or dysfunction. So um, we're very excited about some initial indications that we have a line of sight on and there are plenty more coming you know, beyond that. And you did mention the US Realty Clearance of the ingestible capsule. Where will this take the product and how important was that for your company? So we're, um, we're working at the moment with a strategic partner and shareholder in a company called Planet Innovation out of Melbourne for the product development uh, capabilities that we need. We're also growing the Atmo team itself to continue building the technical capability that we, we need, which we'll need to, to serve the multiple applications that we'll be pursuing. And we're in the process of scoping a pivotal trial that we will be conducting next year in Australia the US, Europe, to gather the data for that regulatory submission for an initial indication. So that's um, where a lot of the funds that we've just raised will be, will be going um, with a view to completing those activities. And the COVID pandemic has obviously affected many businesses. Has this called any stalls for you with regards to the trials and how have you managed to continue progress during this time? Yeah, certainly. I, I, I think everyone's been obviously impacted by you know, unforeseen circumstances and it certainly created challenges for us. I mean, what it meant was that we had to make our budget go further, particularly as a, you know, an early stage startup. So that, that, uh, that created some challenges for us. But, but by, by staying you know, as flexible and certainly as lean as we could be and by being creative, we've managed to not just survive, but also thrive. Um, when COVID, for example, uh, shut down our Melbourne trial sites, um, we went to New Zealand and we developed alternative uh, clinical trial sites elsewhere, um, such as in Christchurch. So planning for and mitigating against threats like COVID um, by having contingencies has enabled us to uh, not only survive, but also to gather the data and achieve the milestones that we've needed. And that's what put us in a good position to be able to raise this latest round, which was not only upscaled, but it was oversubscribed. So it, it's indicative of um, the activity that we've been um, progressing and, and the, the progress that we've been making, but it's also indicative of the, the interest in this space, uh, in what is a nascent field in terms of my, the microbiome and our, our tools to investigate it. Well, it is absolutely marvellous to see progression in this arena and congratulations again on your raise. Thank you, Malcolm. It's been great to chat with you today. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust up your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV.
Good morning and a warm welcome, Sage here for Kalkine TV, reporting to you live from Sydney. And you are watching the Global Markets Roundup. Let's dive into some of the key highlights and happenings from yesterday, starting with the US market. And soaring energy prices retreated and stocks on Wall Street rebounded on Wednesday after the top U.S. Senate Republican backed an extension of the U.S. debt ceiling and Russia calmed volatile natural gas markets in Europe. MSCI's All Country World Index paired losses to trade 0.22% lower. And benchmark U.S. indices closed higher on Wednesday, October 6th, as stocks recovered following a weak start to the trading day and bullish sentiments rose after lawmakers sealed a debt ceiling deal. The S&P 500 was up 0.41% and the Dow Jones rose 0.30%. The Nasdaq Composite rose 0.47%, while the small cap Russell 2000 was down 0.60%. Investors welcomed a key debt deal between Democratic and Republican lawmakers that prevented a potential government default. But still, rising oil and gas prices that could increase inflationary pressure weighed on the investors' minds. And as a result, retail traders kept away from risky bets. Utility, technologies and consumer segments were the top performers on the S&P 500. Energy and basic material sectors trailed. And seven of the 11 index segments stayed in the positive territory. Looking now at the futures and commodities market. Gold futures were up 0.17%. Silver increased by 0.24% while copper fell 0.43%. And Brent oil futures decreased by 2.12% and WTI crude was down 2.42%. Moving on now to the bond market and the 30-year Treasury bond yields were down 0.73% while the 10-year bond yields fell 0.22%. US dollar futures index increased by 0.47%. And now it's time for a small break but do stay tuned as I'll be back with the Asian and Australian market updates. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back. I'm Sage and you're watching the Global Markets Roundup Show. Automakers, retail and travel shares fell more than 2.5% on Wednesday, leading declines across all major sectors in Europe as soaring oil and gas prices intensified concerns inflation will dent economic growth. The Pan-European Stock 600 Index fell 1%, giving back almost all of the gains made on Tuesday. Eurozone bond yields rose as a government bond sell-off driven by concerns about inflation lingered on Wednesday, although yields gave up much of their earlier rise as the US Treasury yields fell by late London trade. The London markets traded in the red zone after the release of the UK construction PMI data. And according to the recently available data from IHS market, CIPS, the UK construction sector, got hit by a shortage of raw materials and staff. And PMI stood at 52.6 during September 2021, down from 55.20 recorded in August. Tesco shares climbed by about 5.95% after the company had announced a £500 million share buyback and raised the full year profit guidance. Moreover, the company had declared an interim dividend in line with the prior year. Germany's 10-year government bond yield, the benchmark of the bloc, rose as much as 4 BPS and hit its highest since the end of June at 0.147%. It edged lower in the late trade following the US Treasury's lower after US employment data showed US private payrolls increased more than expected in September, and was up less than a basis point at 0.18%. 
The pan-European stock 600 index fell 1%, giving back almost all of the gains made on Tuesday. And Japan's Nikkei reversed course on Wednesday to close at a more than six-week low, dragged down by concerns over higher interest rates, China's slowdown and modest approval ratings for the country's new prime minister. The Nikkei share average fell 1.05% to its lowest level since August 23rd. The index, which gained as much as 1.4% earlier in the session, closed in the red for an eighth straight session. South Korean shares on Wednesday closed at their lowest level since late December on worries about surging U.S. Treasury yields while investors await the U.S. payrolls data later in the week. The KOSPI ended 1.82% lower to its lowest close since December 30th, 2020. It reversed early gains of as much as 1.06% that tracked a rebound on Wall Street overnight. The Australian shares are set to rise on Thursday, tracking mildly positive cues from Wall Street, with soaring energy prices likely benefiting the local energy firms. And investors are also positive as they highly expect US Congress to reach a deal to avert a government debt default. The ASX 200 fell 0.6% on Wednesday, and the major ASX listed companies scheduled to pay latest dividends to their shareholders include Breville Group, InvoCare, South32, Super Retail Group, West Farmers. The dollar rose toward a one-year high touched last week as inflation concerns fueled by surging energy prices and the outlook for rising rates knocked investors' appetite for riskier assets. And the dollar index rose 0.22%. Eight percent. The euro was down 0.34 percent. Yen traded down 0.04 percent. And crude oil prices fell following news reports that U.S. stockpiles have increased. Oil prices slipped nearly two percent after hitting multi-year highs. Gold prices edged higher following a silent retreat in the U.S. bond yields, boosting the safe haven asset. And thank you for your company on that report. That is all for now. Do keep watching Calkine TV for more market updates. And this is Sage signing off. Property by Calkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market, as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calcane. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Jeremy Hurst. He's the co-founder and director of the sharing economy platform Space2Co. That is a web platform for sharing short-term rental of spaces. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. A very warm welcome to you today, Jeremy. How are you? Uh, very good, Rachel. Thanks for having me on the show. Good to see you here today. So first off, Jeremy, could you please explain how space to co works? Yeah, of course. So the, what we've created is a platform for the short term hire of spaces in the community. And what that means is essentially we match make people who have a space to people who need a space and vice versa. Um, on the marketplace, you can find all different types of spaces it might be like a co working hot desk, it could be a community hall or community center, it might be even a tennis court. Uh, or a cafe that sits uh, empty 
in the uh, late afternoon and evenings that can be a useful hireable space. Well, it sounds fascinating. Now, I believe your company was a winner at this year's National Eye Awards, receiving the award for Government and Public Sector Solution. So this is a huge honour. What do you believe was behind the achievement of this award? Yeah, great question. I think uh, one, of the, one of the qualities we've had over the years is we just haven't given up. We've been persistent uh, in our journey and we didn't start out thinking that we were going to solve the needs of local government. And it was a bit of a pivot we did back in 2017 to uh, take on uh, the local government market. And it's, it's just been a, a perfect match for us. Uh, we're a small team, but we're, we've recruited incredibly well and we've got an amazing bunch of, of people and we're, we're very organised. Uh, the, the founding team are all former school teachers and we, we do know how to be organised and structure things and that's definitely worked to our advantage. That absolutely sounds like great teamwork there. Now, your company is a WA Local Government Association preferred supplier now. How has this helped your business and what do you believe lies ahead in your near-term pipeline? Look, I think um, being a preferred supplier, um, not just with Walgar, but with local buy for Queensland and the Northern Territory, what that's done is that's given trust in the marketplace and our product and our brand. So when you get on these preferred supplier panels, you have to sort of be rigor tested and go through almost like a tendering process. Um, and look, I think what that's done is that's really uh, just added some validation behind who we are as an organisation, that we're known, that we're trusted and um, that we're, we're, we're worth looking into. In terms of your other question around what's next, I would say it's all around uh, consolidating what we're doing in Australia and New Zealand. And we've also got some exploration work we've, we've already under started with around what other international markets that space to co could be a fit for our concept is um one that translates globally and there is no um look there are shortages of spaces wherever there are people and uh connecting the gaps and showing what spaces are out there in the community uh works as well as in, in any other country other than just what we've got here in australia new zealand Absolutely. And as many of us know, it can be quite complex and also quite slow to book council spaces, particularly. How do you believe this process can be improved? Oh, my gosh. Uh, look, the core focus we've taken to all of this is all around focusing on the customer journey. And so, you know, if you look at the process that most councils have for around how you hire a space, it's a very, very time consuming uh, and there's a lot of back and forth to get your questions answered uh, and to find out the availability of a space. And what we've done is we've given people the answers to most of their questions up front in the, the, the process we have. And that makes it just incredibly fast to find the booking that you need for your family celebration or your work event or whatever it is that you're planning. So uh, it's purely down to the customer experience, Rachel. That's been the big thing we've focused on. Uh, conversely too, for the council, we make the process easier for them. Um, the, sometimes the, the councils have some systems in place that aren't exactly the most modern. And when we sort of give them sort of a more enterprise modern experience, it really helps them be efficient. Um, one classic example is how they collect a bond for say a whole hire. Uh, if you wanted to grab like a $500 bond, that money has to be basically collected off the hirer it's put into a trust account, uh, then the bond, then the activity happens in the whole, in 99.9% .9 of cases, they actually don't hold a bond, they have to return it to the guest. And that process involves them raising a credit note, handing that to a finance officer to authorise that uh, refund, handing it to another officer to um, actually do the transaction and get the money back to the hire and that process can take six weeks and you know there's a lot of people in the community that don't want to be without their $500 or $1,000 um, that's held up in a local council bond flow. So yeah we've really improved that down to uh, automatically 
are sending the funds back to the hire. So once again, customer experience. That sounds great. And as you mentioned, customer experience there, what do you believe are the three key ways in which you create the ideal customer experience? Uh, one of the things we've done all the way through our journey is user testing. So we do listen to the customer, we sit down, we interview them, we find out what it is that trips them up, what it is they, they love, what it is they don't love, and we lean into that feedback and we iterate on it very, very rapidly. So that's probably one of the core things we've done and we continue to do all the way through um, the development of our product. We're a two-sided marketplace. So we have customers who have space to share and we have customers who are looking to hire a space. And so we make sure that we're user testing on both sides of that marketplace. Um, the other thing we do is we hold a quarterly session with all of our local government partners that we call Space to Co-Create. And the purpose of Space to Co-Create is to share stories, to lean in and listen to feedback uh, around how the platform's being used. And from those co-create sessions, we've come up with some ideas that we wouldn't have otherwise learned about. Um, so that's been absolutely um, fabulous. And, and the other thing we do is we run surveys, we have space reviews on the platform, and we glean a lot of insight from those as well. That sounds great. And just finally, how has the COVID-19 pandemic either helped or hindered your business? Oh, that's an awesome question. So for us, we, uh, we've we been focused and we're quite lucky and almost just fallen on our feet in this way. Uh, we work with uh, WA, South Australia and New Zealand predominantly. And if you look at three areas that have been largely immune somewhat to the COVID pandemic, it's been those three areas. So we've been very lucky that they are almost our three first um, core markets. So the impact of COVID has not been terrible uh, for us. Of course, we've had lockdowns and disruption, but uh, we've been able to use that to our advantage. A couple of things uh, have come up. So first and foremost is suddenly there is this acceptance that we don't have to jump on a plane and go and meet somebody in person at a great cost to our business. We can actually just do a Zoom or Teams call and have the meetings that we need all online, which is super efficient, uh, faster and way less costly, uh, which has been an absolute game changer. When we had the big lockdown of sort of uh, March, April, May 2020, we actually doubled down on some development on our platform and we, able, we were able to really take the platform offline and roll out a huge uh, update to space to go And had we not had that downtime, it would have been much, much harder to, to, to do that big update push. So yeah, we can, we're actually one of those companies that says the COVID pandemic has actually been an, an enabler and helped us on our journey, funnily enough. Excellent. It definitely sounds as though it has helped you along. Well, it's been great chatting with you today, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me on, Rachel. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. A new cryptocurrency built on the Solana network has made incredible gains in the past seven days, growing over 26%.
The price of FIDA, which is the native token of the Bond FIDA network, has rallied recently along with many other digital currencies, experiencing continued growth since August. On August 1, FIDA was priced at one US dollar and 90 cents with a market cap of 85.55 million US dollars. The price of FIDA has now shot up by an impressive 250% since August. And in this segment, we'll take a deep dive into FIDA, but just quickly, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Okay, so what is Bon Feeder? Bon Feeder is a product suite launched in December 2020 on the popular Solana network. The Solana network has had a rough month despite being one of the most popular altcoins of 2021. The Bon Feeder suite was launched with the objective of developing the future of decentralized finance or DeFi within the Solana platform. What does Bon Feeder include? Well, firstly, Bonfita includes an on-chain perpetual swap, which is an agreement that allows counterparties to non-conditionally trade an asset at any point in the future. Two, a Solana name service for auctioning and transacting readable Solana addresses. And three, Bonfita bots allow users to automate trading strategies and do copy trading on the Serum Decentralized Exchange, or DEX. Serum also exists on the Solana platform and touts itself as permissionless, high speed, and importantly, low cost. But what is the FIDA token? FIDA offers value accrual, staking rewards, and fee discounts. After being introduced to the market in December 2020 at approximately 50 cents a piece, its price hit its peak on September 11, 2021 at 8 US dollars and 58 cents before taking a dive, but then led to the start of the rally since September 30 to where it currently sits at 6 US dollars and 80 cents. So where can you buy FIDA? Although FIDA has been listed on a number of cryptocurrency exchanges, unfortunately, it can't be purchased directly with a fiat currency. However, it can still easily be purchased by buying USDT from any fiat to crypto exchange and then transferring that to the exchange that offers to trade this coin. Binance is the best option for this. Given Bonfita's current bull run and its multitude of partnerships, including AKG Venture, Fisher 8, and CMT Digital, FIDA looks like a good coin to hold on to into the near future. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other crypto-related information you'd like us to take a look at. And of course, don't forget to click the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix, with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released, and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is I 
heck is this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements. 
with Calkine TV. subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of Calkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us on our trending topic. Today we're covering how long will the COVID-19 pandemic last? Will it continue into 2022? As the world is battling its once in a hundred years deadly contagion in the form of COVID-19's pandemic, the people are eagerly awaiting its end. And the question on the end of the pandemic is on the mind of many people. But no one can give a definitive deadline on when the pandemic is going to depart for good. It could have been an easy guess in normal circumstances. The faster the vaccination drive, the faster we would see the end of the pandemic. But then there are variables that are beyond human control and send every calculation for a toss. And when we talk about the variables, mutations play a crucial role in that. Had the virus not mutated into Delta variant across the globe, with most of the world's population vaccinated by the year's end, we could have seen some kind of normalcy restored to the world. The more the mutations crop up, the lesser the effectiveness of vaccines. And there is clearly an inverse relationship between the two. Now that said, we will have to wait for the virus to die its natural death, and like what happened in the case of the Spanish flu a century ago. But the larger question is whether it will end or not. And flu pandemics occur when populations are naive to a virus, and that is when the masses lack immunity. And by the time of a pandemic virus becomes seasonal, much of the population has attained some immunity against it. Seasonal flus still cause a significant death toll globally, claiming roughly 650,000 lives per year. But it seems like acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS, the ongoing pandemic has high chances of becoming an endemic, and that is, here it is to stay forever. Or at least, that is what the experts say. I think this virus is here to stay with us and it will evolve like influenza pandemic viruses. It will evolve to become one of the other viruses that affect us. Dr Mike Ryan, Executive Director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program, said in his own words last week. The bottom line, no one knows if the pandemic is going to dissolve away forever or end up being an endemic. And meanwhile, it's going through the peak of the third wave and more and more mutations are coming out. With three-fourths of this year already spent, it is highly likely that we will have to live with this virus in 2022 as well. Thanks for joining us in the report. And if you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, and you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. For more information and regular updates, do head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. Stay here for Calkine Media. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. 
Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello, thanks for joining us on Kalkine TV for this breaking news update. The New South Wales Roadmap to Freedom has received a facelift from new Premier Dominic Perrottet. The major changes include a return to in-person schooling from the 25th of October. Public swimming pools will also be allowed to open. 20 visitors will be allowed in the home from October 11 and groups of 50 people are permitted to gather in outdoor areas. At 80% of double vaccination rates, masks will no longer be made mandatory in offices in a move designed to encourage workers and employees to shift from remote working. In a major change for regional workers, they will now be permitted to resume working in essential services with just one vaccination, owing to diverted supplies from many regional areas and restrictive access. They will, however, be required to have received both doses by November 1. Also, the COVID crisis cabinet has received a facelift. It will now be known as the COVID and Economic Recovery Committee. Major outdoor events, such as concerts and festivals, will be capped to 5,000 people. However, special exemptions may be granted. Additionally, the daily briefings will now occur earlier in the day, believed to be at 9 a.m. as of October 11, replacing the previous 11 a.m. conferences that were held by former Premier Gladys Berejiklian. Despite his comments on September 24 on 2GB, in which Dominic Perrottet stated, once every single person in this state has had the opportunity to be vaccinated, then we should open up for everyone. I want to see more unity and not a two-tiered society. It's not the government's role to provide freedom. Despite those comments, no clarity has been provided for unvaccinated individuals. In the past 24 hours, the positive caseload has continued to drop, falling to 587 positive cases. Chief Health Officer Kerry Chant was a notable absentee of the conference. However, both Premier Perrottet and Health Minister Brad Hazard confirmed robust discussions with Chant last night that subsequently resulted in the roadmaps update this morning. And at Kalkine, we'll be sure to keep you across the latest updates from this space. That's all for now, though. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. 
from the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. So the question on everyone's lips is Sai a token for the short term or for keeps? Let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkine Media. The Save Your Assets Crypto is a decentralized finance experiment and is a new type of deflationary currency which is used for autonomous yield and liquidity generation. SIA is the underlying currency of the Flu's ecosystem and works on a Binance Smart Chain protocol. It uses tax, reflection, LP acquisition and burn to ensure liquidity and saves a lot of transaction costs for investors. Founded by Lemayne Shalufi and Daniel Van Dalen, Sire's volume is directly correlated to the Sire's pumping ability. With its adaptive ecosystem, the Flues trade is a humanizing crypto and is one of the easiest ways for a new investor to trade in cryptocurrencies at the cheapest rates and fastest routes. So why is Sire crypto unique? Well, SIA comes across as a protocol that offers good returns for investors. And with the humanizing feature, it gives the investors a feel of trading. For every transaction, the protocol automatically applies a 10% tax with each transaction. This is distributed in various capacities. Of the 10% tax, approximately 2% is automatically made available to the token holders in the form of instant boost. Token holders receive another 2% following the community boost. The holders can also burn the cryptocurrency and receive 2% as part of the burning fee. Another 2% is contributed to the liquidity pools to ensure the liquidity is maintained in the token. So is it a good investment then? Well, SIA is ranked 4,265th on CoinMarketCap. It has a market cap of around 22,145 US dollars. Following its launch in May, SIA's fortunes have fluctuated. It's seen a good momentum in the earlier days of the launch, but following the market crash in June and August, it wasn't doing so well. But in late September, it saw an upward trend with the volume soaring by 11.6% on Friday, the 1st of October. So many experts believe that being new on the platform, SIA needs a bit of time to stabilize in the market for people to have complete confidence in it. Early investors have benefited by selling it when the market was doing well. But there are a few sections who believe it would do well if you held on to it. Now, if you like this information, please like, share and comment on this video. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also press the bell icon for notifications for our other videos. And for more updates, you can log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel, signing off for Calkine Media. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video, I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. 
The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with season two racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that season two finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season one focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season two is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, or have you calling out, Wilson! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell, and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? 
Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Everyone, this is Rachel live from Calkind Studios, and you're watching The Early Trades, a show where we share with you a glimpse of the Australian share market at the open, along with the global and domestic drivers triggering market momentum. Australian shares did open higher this morning, tracking mildly positive cues from Wall Street, with soaring energy prices likely to benefit local energy firms. Investors are also positive as they highly expect a U.S. Congress to reach a deal to avert a government debt default. The ASX 200 opened the day, gaining 0.57%, after falling 0.6% to 7,206.5 points yesterday. Nine of 11 sectors have traded lower over the week. Although little has changed, consumer staples is today's best-performing sector so far. The major ASX-listed companies scheduled to pay latest dividends to their shareholders include the Breville Group, Invocare, South32 Super Retail Group and West Farmers. The top gainers of the day on the ASX during opening trade are Collins Foods, Clinaval Pharmaceuticals, Janus Henderson Group, Aluka Resources and Hub24. The bottom performing stocks are Beach Energy, Oil Search, Illumina, Domino's Pizza and Osnet Services. Over on Wall Street, the Dow Jones was up 0.05%, the S&P 500 was up 0.15% and the Nasdaq ended 0.2% higher. Moving on, let's take a look at some major developments in the U.S. market. Soaring energy prices retreated and stocks on Wall Street rebounded yesterday after the top U.S. Senate Republican backed an extension of the U.S. debt ceiling and Russia calmed a volatile natural gas markets in Europe. The unrelated moves eased growing angst amongst investors over a possible historic default on U.S. government debt. U.S. natural gas futures plunged more than 10 percent a day after they soared to a 12-year high. Earlier, a strong private payrolls report helped boost expectations that the U.S. Federal Reserve would soon taper its massive bond purchases. U.S. private payrolls increased by 568,000 jobs in September as COVID-19 infections subsided. That's according to the employment report from the ADP that pointed to a recovering jobs market. Now let's take a very short break. I'll be back soon. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. And welcome back. You're watching Calkine TV live from Sydney, and this is the Early Trade Show. Let's take a look at some prominent ASX shares during early trades. The first company on our list today is restaurant group Collins Foods. They've entered into a deal to run the franchise business of KFC Netherlands. Collins Foods will develop, manage, and operate the KFC Netherlands as part of the deal. The KFC Netherlands is a subsidiary of New York-listed Yum! brands. It will de develop up to 130 new KFC restaurants in the Netherlands over the next 10 years. The share price of Collins Foods was trading at $12.54 during early trade. 
The next company is buy now, pay later player Sezzle, which has entered into a partnership with U.S. retail player Target ahead of the holiday season. Sezzle first announced the news on the 3rd of June. Another buy now, pay later partner of Target called Affirm saw their share soar 20% on the Nasdaq following the partnership's launch. Through the partnership with Affirm and Sezzle, Target is investing in new financial tools to make shopping experiences more flexible and personalized. The share price of Sezzle was trading at $5.19 during opening trade. Next company on our list is Cube. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has announced it will investigate Cube's $90 million acquisition of the Newcastle Agri Terminal. Cube was requested by the ACCC to delay the transaction after competition concerns were raised by market participants. Following the acquisition, Cube is alleged to engage in anti-competitive business practices. The share price of Cube is trading at $3.28 during opening trade. Looking at the bond yields, the yields on the U.S. Treasury 10-year benchmark fell from more than three-month peaks. 10-year notes yields fell to 0.7 basis points to 1.524%. In the currency space, the dollar rose towards the one-year high, touched last week as inflation concerns fueled by surging energy prices and the outlook for rising rates knocked investors' appetite for riskier assets. The dollar index rose 0.228%, while the euro was down 0.34%. And the yen tracked down by 0.04%. Moving on to the oil space, prices of crude oil fell following news reports that U.S. stockpiles have increased. Oil prices slipped nearly 2% after hitting multi-year highs. Brent crude futures fell 1.79% to settle at $81.08 a barrel. And U.S. crude settled down 1.9% to $77.43 a barrel. Energy stocks such as Woodside Petroleum were trading lower during early trade. Whereas Santos edged lower during early trade this morning. Meanwhile, gold prices edged higher following a silent retreat in U.S. bond yields, boosting the safe haven asset. U.S. gold futures settled up 0.1%. ASX listed gold stocks such as Northern Star Resources were seen in the green during early trade, while Newcrest Mining was also trading lower during opening trade this morning. That's all for the early trades this morning. This is Rachel signing off, but stay tuned to Calkine TV as we bring you more shows with live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How 
is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty Amongst Others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway, starring Tom Hanks, will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times, truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. Surprise. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying, Serenity now! If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mitchell Travers. Mitchell is the co-founder and MD of Oz Merchant. Oz Merchant is um, someone we're going to chat to at Calcine where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello Mitchell and welcome to Calcine. Hey. Yeah, great to be on the show. Good to speak with you today. Now, firstly, Mitch, we'd love to hear more about the company and if you could talk about the innovative wealth management portal that you have there. Yeah, so Ausmerchant is a digital currency exchange um, and what we're looking to do is provide an easy transition between traditional finance and the new emerging blockchain-enabled financial system. Um, so our wealth management portal is a custodial wallet um, which can host up to 150 different uh, cryptocurrencies for all of our 
uh, merchant customers, business to business customers, um, investors, consumers. Um, and what we do is we support them with the Australian dollar, fiat, on-ramp, off-ramp into this digital currency ecosystem, um, but also look to offer future products such as um, decentralized finance, savings accounts, um, a blockchain back office accounting solution, so businesses can issue invoices in Australian dollars but receive payment in cryptocurrency and give their uh, the option um, of payment options. So, yeah. Excellent. It sounds wonderful. Now, the blockchain approach to finance is more streamlined and advanced and also transparent. In your opinion, how will the blockchain approach transform the finance industry globally over the next few years? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question, actually. And I think that we'll see more transformations um, over time as well. And the really great thing about uh, the blockchain approach to finance is that uh, you can really leverage this um, triple entry accounting system where uh, transactions are auditable on a public chain, they're secured, they're immutable, um, so there is more transparency as you said and auditability to any transaction that goes through, um, which has all sorts of benefits for um, regulators uh, such as the ATO um, doing tax, uh, as well as uh, innovators in fintech um, allowing for you to leverage the technology to create more amazing products to ease our financial transition, get access to new um, income streams, uh, etc. There's yeah, some fantastic benefits to blockchain technology. Now for people who are new to digital currencies, can you give your expert opinion on how they can become accustomed to the future of finance? Yeah, so I think a good way to start um, with digital currencies is um, to sort of ease your way in, uh, take a moderate risk, one that you're able to um, really justify. Uh, my suggestion to a lot of our clients is to dollar cost average in. Um, so buy a little bit of Bitcoin or Ethereum um, every month um, for some time while you educate on the market and learn about uh, the advantages of blockchain technology and uh, the potential it has to revolutionize multiple financial services and um, general industries. And then after you are more comfortable with the technology, perhaps go through a industry custodial provider such as Oz Merchants, so there is less technology vulnerabilities and you can have a trusted partner to help you ease with that transition. Um, that's when you can really make more educated um, decisions on entering the market in a more profound way. Um, so, yeah. And do you see a specific demographic coming to Oz Merchant? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Oz Merchant is quite unique in the Australian digital currency market, um, actually, because we're focusing on doing a business to business service offering. So we help merchants um, accept cryptocurrency as payment. Um, we give them the option to automatically transfer and trade that into Australian dollars so that they're, um, the price of their product is not affected by the market volatility. Um, so there has been a significant uptick actually in merchants, especially luxury goods, uh, looking to leverage the benefits and the whole new investor class who are getting wealthy in cryptocurrencies who are now looking for ways to spend it. Um, so a few of our clients, such as uh, a sports car dealership, are only getting more and more customers sending requests through to pay their invoices in cryptocurrency, uh, and that's the service that we provide. Um, I guess another trend we see is um, crypto is easier for younger generations to understand and jump in. Um, so we're actually seeing an emerging wealth class um, of these younger generations who have been in the crypto industry for a few years now, uh, who ha now have disposable income that they had not previously ever had access to or been high net worth individuals. So it's quite an interesting space for these businesses and merchants to reach a whole new um, sort of customer base of wealthy younger individuals. Totally. And how do you believe the pandemic has affected the overall crypto market? Yeah, so interestingly, I think the pandemic has been uh, to an extent a benefit for the crypto market because what we're talking about here is largely digital money, right? And during the pandemic, a lot of people unfortunately were stuck at home, more time was spent on the internet and we're seeing a lot more communities and online communities actually growing while people find belonging online 
as opposed to in the sort of physical world. Um, so cryptocurrency, I think, has largely benefited, and we've seen a huge uptick in the amount of wallets and users uh, creating and entering the market um, as this news uh, disseminates throughout the entire online world. Um, we get, yeah, uh, the pandemic affecting it um, in a positive way. I think uh, another sort of contrast to that is the way that the pandemic affects the traditional markets largely, and the evidence of that this week has been quite evident. Um, we can see that the traditional equities um, had a bit of a shock uh, last week and over the um, previous time due to the high energy prices and a, few, a lot of news coming out of America um, with the debt ceiling. And what cryptocurrency enables is an alternative uh, to that. And we're actually seeing in more recent times a decoupling of the correlation between the price of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and traditional equities. Um, so I'm quite interested to actually follow that progress and see if that correlation, the break of correlation continues um, to sort of show that pandemic trend. And just finally, Mitchell, in the current revival phase, what should be the strategy for investors to frame a tailor-made approach to entail the best returns? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm a strong advocate of dollar cost averaging, as I mentioned before, um, especially if you're new to the market. Um, another thing I would suggest is really focusing on the major two currencies, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, to begin with when you enter the market. They have the most um, somewhat uh, liquidity available, and they're also the most secure blockchains. Um, so you're really looking at the strongest assets in the ecosystem. Uh, once you are com comfortable and confident with those assets, you can then start to diversify your portfolio with a, a smaller percentage um, in these more high risk but asymmetric investment opportunities um, in the terms of other cryptocurrencies uh, which service the entire ecosystem, uh, such as decentralized finance or even NFTs. Well, it's been fantastic to chat with you today, Mitchell, and to learn more okay. about Ozmerch. And thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to next time. Thank you. Excellent. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Thanks for joining us yet again on a trending topic. Today we're covering which companies do accept Dogecoin as a payment. Earlier, when somebody talked about making purchases through a QR scan, transferring cryptocurrency from one wallet to another, it sounded like a process related to science fiction. But in present times, it has become a reality. And as more and more retail outlets and businesses are accepting cryptocurrency payments, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Recently, Dogecoin became the seventh crypto to be accepted as a form of payment on Coinbase Commerce a US-based e-commerce platform. Why are businesses accepting cryptos? Well, earlier, spending digital assets involved a lot of hassles as users had to transfer tokens to the crypto exchange, trade them and then transfer the said money into their bank account to spend. However, with a tremendous surge in the popularity of owning cryptocurrencies, more and more businesses have now started accepting crypto payments. Some users are buying gift cards, 
from their crypto money, while others are taking up debt cards offered by Coinbase Global, etc., enabling them to spend their crypto assets anywhere where Visa is accepted. So why is there a surge in Dogecoin payments? It is widely known that SpaceX and Tesla's head Elon Musk's love for Dogecoin. He has openly rallied for the meme cryptocurrency and often his tweets and various references on the meme bring a surge in the price of the dog themed cryptocurrency. Recently, he opined that it's impossible to destroy crypto's growing popularity, though it can be slowed down owing to government's intervention. Which companies are accepting Dogecoin? Many companies have now started accepting Dogecoin as a method of payment. And some of the high profile companies which accept the meme crypto payments or will begin doing so in the near future are the Dallas Mavericks, an NBA team, Kronos Advanced Technologies Inc, an air purification tech company, Bots Inc, which operates in digital robotics space, Air Baltic, an airline service, Post Oak Motor Cars, a Gulf Coast's luxury car dealership and repair service company, SpaceX, a state diamond jewelry, Energy Electronics, a US based mobile solutions distributor, Snell.com, a web hosting provider, New Egg, which is an e retailer. Host me now, UK's web hosting company. So why is Dogecoin more popular among small businesses? Various small and mid-sized businesses are favoring Dogecoin over Bitcoin, as the former has some obvious benefits. Owing to unlimited supply, Dogecoin is better equipped to handle day-to-day -day transactions. Dogecoin has lower transaction fees, and also it has relatively faster transaction times as compared to Bitcoin. In conclusion, an increased number of companies have begun including the dog themed cryptocurrency as an alternative method of payment to offer more flexibility and payment options to their consumers. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please subscribe to the channel and if you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, do head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. My name's Sage from Calkai Media. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space. From updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello everyone, Sage here. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Today's guest is Mr. Darren Nelson, the director and founder of Solace Sleep. And today's expert will share insights on helming the ship for Solace Sleep, a national online and retail bedding company specialising in adjustable beds as well as mattresses and pillows. The beds are functional, elegant and affordable. And their purpose is to provide a better sleep and to ease the pain as part of their customer's health journey. So we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today we're very lucky to have live with us Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solace Sleep. Welcome to the show, Darren. Good morning, Sage. Thank you for having me. 
It's a pleasure to e-meet you. And I'm glad to share this great piece of news with the viewers that Solar Sleep could increase its sales by 400% since the pandemic hit in 2020. And despite mm. the regressing market, you achieved astounding growth. Darren, please share your strategies behind achieving such great success. Well, I, look, it, it starts with, uh, I suppose, what everybody expects from a business. Uh, sometimes we don't get it, which is just, we're a, a family business. So those, those family values, those ethics, uh, we treat people the way they expect to be treated. Uh, a lot of it's got to do with our pricing strategy as well. We're factory direct pricing. Um, typically, we're about half the price of uh, you know normal betting retailers out there. And we've developed product that suits the market in terms of, as you said before, their health journey. Um, we've developed product that is easily delivered totally around Australia for their online purchases. And we've got a fully stocked warehouse, which is really important because when an adjustable bed comes along, a lot of it's got to do on an urgency of a health crisis, um, pain, comfort. Uh, people don't want to wait 10 to 12 weeks for their product. No, especially when it's going to ease the pain or give them a better night's sleep. And with the advent of the new work from home culture, people now mm. spend more time in their homes. Do you think this change has affected how people view and invest in their furniture and beds especially? Totally, totally. What people are saying to themselves now is their health um, and their sleep is one of the highest levels what they put on their criteria about their uh, their own body uh, and we're playing catch up in this country sleep is now becoming a really hot topic and people are understanding the value of sleep because as they move through different stages of life they want uh, as i said before their health to be consistent in terms of the people staying at home um, they're challenged with uh, trying to find a peaceful place in their house to um, conduct their business. Often that's done uh, in the bedroom. Often that's done propped up with a couple of pillows and it's not helping their posture. So they're looking for something that's going to um, perform everything they need to perform and that's typically an adjustable bed. And it's never too early, I think, to start investing in your neck and spine um, because mm. the, you'll reap the benefits in the long run. I think you're exactly right there. Posture is so important. So speaking of comfort, older people need more comfortable beds as they spend perhaps longer hours in their homes. And we are making our homes like our own personal oasis these days, which is great. So how yep. do you ensure that your beds are super comfortable and warm for people of all generations? Well, we start with, um, I suppose, our core belief that uh, first we have a range of product that gives people options. Um, they don't have just one choice and it's not logical for people just to have one mattress. Um, as we know, uh, when we purchased our mattresses over a long period of time, uh, we need to have an option in mattresses and we need to be explained what that option is. So there's a lot of scientific proof about what mattresses are best for you. And we go through a whole bit of, uh, I, I suppose, understanding what the customer needs, understanding where they've come from and where they want to go. In terms of uh, people staying at home in an older generation, they're also valuing that more than they ever have because they want their um, health and again their home care to be done in their own environment. They don't want to go to a aged care facility or some sort of care facility, particularly as we are understanding that's more of a high risk environment today. And I think you probably want to invest in a bed that is adjustable and is um, able to be used in times when perhaps you become sick instead of having to at that time then hire out a new bed and then have to make the changes around so why not invest in something that's going to provide you with all the functions and features and, and to get the most use out of it before something drastic happens yeah I see what you mean um, and we, we, sorry 
we, we often talk to people about something that we all know, which mm. is you rather be, um, you know, you rather take care of your health now. So in other words, uh, preventing anything than then trying to cure something later on. So the prevention stage is critical because you get more oxygen into your blood stream. Uh, you get better, a better postural relief, as I said before, and typically um, you're getting a deeper sleep. So with a deeper, longer sleep, your brain and your body is repairing itself overnight. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Prevention is better than the cure. You're absolutely spot on. Thanks for that. And you have used pressure mapping in your beds. Would you please also elaborate on the benefits that uh, pressure mapping provides to people? Yeah, again, critical. What we're, what we're seeing now with our, I suppose, our extra bit of advice, our extra bit of, um, I suppose, prescription based, you know, understanding again that body and how you do that is by measuring the pressure points on their body. So then we can tell people, okay, how high typically do you need to raise your head? How high do you need to raise your feet? And when you get those two combinations together, that reduces the pressure off your body. Because the people that toss and turn all night, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing that because the blood flow around their body is stopped. So your brain says, turn me over. I don't like the fact that my blood's not flowing around. That is just another indication or that is the core indication of pressure. Uh, so if we can map their pressure uh, and then we can understand what we can do. For example, even me, I was be able to show when we first started to test it that my body sits on a bit of a skew because um, over many, many years ago, I had a knee injury and that makes my one leg touch shorter than the other. So I could see where my pressure was. Right, very interesting. And thanks for sharing your own personal journey as well there. And Darren, since you have been working with occupational ter therapists, could you please give your nuanced opinion about uh, positional and comfort therapy? I know you've just touched on it then, but if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that too. Absolutely. What we know is our bodies and our shape of our body should not sleep flat. And that's where postural therapy, positional therapy comes into play. It again means that it might mean um, typically putting your body in a position where uh, again we reduce pain, reduce swelling. It may be things like uh, lung disease, um, again oxygen flow into your body. It, it typically can be as little as uh, chronic snoring, sleep apnea. Things like that is all about positional therapy and an occupational therapist looks for our advice from point of view where that best position is to ease pain, provide better comfort, um, really just about health because they're trying to again provide a health journey going forward for their client. In terms of comfort therapy, as I touched on before, there's a whole big pile of different ranges of mm. uh, indicators that we need to be careful of. One more than anything is things like when you're transferring from a mobility device, be it a wheelchair or a mobile chair in some ways, about how secure and safe the edge of that mattress is, um, to the height of the mattress, to the amount of pressure relief it gives. Um, that's what we call comfort therapy. And then you need positional therapy and comfort therapy to match to those clients' needs. And that's again a lot to do with that pressure mapping and a lot to do with the understanding of what the occupational therapist needs and also what the client needs. Yes, absolutely. And um, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you mentioned having a deeper sleep can aid in the prevention of uh, things down the track that could go wrong with your posture and even with your organs because at night time is apparently na natural therapists tell me when your organs are healing and it's important to have a complete focus on that and not be tossing and turning all night 
Well, Darren, I've really enjoyed your insights today. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your passion for Thank your project. You was, there any, oh, um, my pleasure. was there any final comments you'd like to share before we wind up today's discussion? Mm -hmm. Look, I just, I just encourage everybody to consider their sleep. Um, you need to get a long, uh, valuable sleep. And often many people say they've slept for seven hours, eight hours, but still don't feel healthy in the morning or they feel like they haven't slept. And that's got a lot to do with the fact, that, as I said before, that tossing and turning, that pressure. Um, and you need... Um, and I, this is really important, you need to get into a deeper sleep. And if you do that, your body will then react beneficially to that deeper sleep. Great advice and a fantastic note to finish up on there. Thanks, Darren, for your time today and for joining us on Calcine TV. And if you've just joined us, we had a very inspiring discussion. Mr. Darren Nelson, the founder and director of Solar Sleep. And your body might thank you if you check out his website and the offerings his store will give you. The full recorded interview will be available later at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. So please check it out. And thanks for your time watching. Stay watching Kalkine TV for more live expert talks and market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. constantly evolving need for energy efficiency on making the world rely even more on liquefied natural gas. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Kalkine Media. China recently became the world's leading importer of liquefied natural gas. There's a huge potential for LNG in growing economies too, with most of the population in middle or low income groups affordable and clean energy like LNG is desired. So with that, it seems investment in LNG stocks could be a great idea. Natural gas is a low carbon emitting fossil fuel. It has industrial, commercial and residential uses. The global energy market is emerging as one of the fastest growing energy segments. Looking at the supply side, Australia is the world's largest exporter of LNG. Its dramatic expansion in liquefied gas production and export is making it less reliant on conventional energy. While it battles Qatar on the supply front, Aussie LNG exports have grown in the last decade. So there's a lot of opportunity for long-term investors in the Australian LNG industry. With this, let's take a look at the top 10 LNG stocks on the ASX. First one is the biggie, Woodside Petroleum. They have global footprints and focus on oil and gas exploration, production and marketing. They look to deliver value through energy transition via LNG and hydrogen assets. In the first quarter of 2021, it achieved record spot LNG prices from contracts. They have a current annual dividend yield of 2.8%. Next up, Santos Energy Holdings, an Australian energy pioneer producing and marketing natural gas. They posted positive numbers in the first quarter of 2021. In May, they started the Phase 3C infill drilling program at the Bayou Undone Field in the Timor Sea, which extended its offshore LNG facilities. Next up, Oil Search, a gas explorer with 98% of company assets in Papua New Guinea. They reported a 16% quarter-on-quarter growth in the operating revenues for the first quarter, ending the 31st of March 2021. It has strong cash flows in its LNG businesses and critical projects have support from government as well. Its strategy is to have large scale, low cost, high growth assets in its business. Next up, Origin Energy specializes in the production and sale of LNG. Its March 2021 quarter met 7% growth in revenue driven by higher LNG spot prices. It's also seen customer inflows in the LNG segment and expanded operations into Japan. The company pays regular dividends. Its current annual dividend yield stands at 4.83%. 
The Viva Energy Group refines, imports and delivers LNG and petroleum products to retail and commercial clients. Back in May, it committed its Geelong project to the federal government's long-term fuel security package. This will help it achieve cash break-even levels and the support is expected to last until 2024. Well-known Beach Energy has onshore and offshore oil and gas production plants across Australia and New Zealand. In their March 2021 quarter, its revenues increased 14% from the previous quarter. It's also been receiving strong interest from potential LNG buyers in Western Australia. As a result, they've been paying constant dividends of one cent per share, and its annual dividend yield is 1.57%. Karoon Energy is yet another oil and gas explorer listed on the ASX. It has significant assets in Brazil and recently changed its reporting currency to the American dollar. That's to portray a better picture of operations. Despite the adverse effects of COVID-19 on Brazil, the company maintained its operations in the first half of 2021. Strike Energy is another ASX listed oil and gas producer. The company is also into urea production. It's taken significant steps in leading Australia towards becoming the lowest carbon urea producing region globally. Its West Eregala gas project in WA showed some good drilling results in the past. Xenex Energy is another natural gas producer. They're focused on advancing high return, long life, low cost natural gas assets in Queensland. It's also divested its Cooper Basin assets to Beach Energy. The company delivered a strong result in the first half of financial year 2021. Its total natural gas production was up by 271% on the prior corresponding period. Cooper Energy is an upstream oil and gas exploration and production company. Gas production during the period rose 101% against the prior corresponding period. They are diversifying their operations into LNG via the Seoul Gas Agreements. That's in anticipation of a record growth in production, revenue and cash flows due to this. So there you have it, the top 10 LNG stocks on the ASX. If you like this, please like, share and comment on this video and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. For regular updates and more information, log on to our website, calkindmedia.com. I'm Rachel Jones, signing off. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. So the question on everyone's lips is Sai a token for the short term or for keeps? Let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. The Save Your Assets Crypto is a decentralized finance experiment and is a new type of deflationary currency which is used for autonomous yield and liquidity generation. SIA is the underlying currency of the Flu's ecosystem and works on a Binance Smart Chain protocol. It uses tax, reflection, LP acquisition and burn to ensure liquidity and saves a lot of transaction costs for investors. Founded by Lemayne Shalufi and Daniel Van Dalen, Sire's volume is directly correlated to the Sire's pumping ability. With its adaptive ecosystem, the Flues trade is a humanizing crypto and is one of the easiest ways for a new investor to trade in cryptocurrencies at the cheapest rates and fastest routes.
So why is Sire Crypto unique? Well, Sire comes across as a protocol that offers good returns for investors. And with the humanizing feature, it gives the investors a feel of trading. For every transaction, the protocol automatically applies a 10% tax with each transaction. This is distributed in various capacities. Of the 10% tax, approximately 2% is automatically made available to the token holders in the form of instant boost. Token holders receive another 2% following the community boost. The holders can also burn the cryptocurrency and receive 2% as part of the burning fee. Another 2% is contributed to the liquidity pools to ensure the liquidity is maintained in the token. So is it a good investment then? Well, Sire is ranked 4,265th on a coin market cap. It has a market cap of around 22,145 US dollars. Following its launch in May, Sire's fortunes have fluctuated. It's seen a good momentum in the earlier days of the launch, but following the market crash in June and August, it wasn't doing so well. But in late September, it saw an upward trend with the volume soaring by 11.6% on Friday, the 1st of October. So many experts believe that being new on the platform, Sire needs a bit of time to stabilize in the market for people to have complete confidence in it. Early investors have benefited by selling it when the market was doing well. But there are a few sections who believe it would do well if you held on to it. Now, if you like this information, please like, share and comment on this video. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also press the bell icon for notifications for our other videos. And for more updates, you can log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media and today's trending topic covers are these five high growth technology shares on the NZX. Technology stocks have become popular due to increased digital technology adoption by almost every sector. Cloud computing, 5G, data analytics are offering many opportunities to various companies. Amid this backdrop, let's have a look at how these five NZX listed tech stocks are performing. Enprise Group Limited, investment vehicles for high growth tech companies. Enprise Group released its annual report for the 30th of June 2021 on the 28th of September, in which a review of operations and outlook was done. The review revealed that strong progress is evident in productivity and economies of scale and is shown in the profitability of the enterprise division. KKR-owned Myob has also experienced major alterations in both company shape and product emphasis. ENS ended the day 3% in the red to close at $1.94. ENS shares provided a year-to-date return of 157.14% to date. Geo Limited. 
The software platform provider for tradies, Geo Limited, stated on Monday that it had raised $6 million from issuing ordinary shares at 13 cents per share. The firm also plans to perform a successive capital raise in coming months to allow its wider shareholder base to take part at the same price. And the funds raised will be used for general working capital purposes as part of accelerating GEO's growth strategy. GEO ended the day 13.92% in the green to close at 18 cents and GEO shares provided a year-to-date return of 50% to date. Vista Group International Limited Cinema Management Solutions Designer Vista Group recently reported a total revenue of $44.9 million and an EBITDA of $6.4 million in the first half of 2021 amid a wide industry recovery and a free flow of movies into global cinemas. VGL ended the day 1.11% in the red to close at $2.67 and Vista shares provided a year-to-date return of 44.97%. Serco Limited Corporate travel and expense solutions provider Serco reported that its overall revenue had fallen 37% to $16.9 million in the financial year 21. Serco joined Booking.com and the Zeno brand underwent validation in North America. SKO ended the day 1.21% in the red to close at $8.15. SKO shares delivered a year-to-date return of 41.11%. Gentrack Group Limited, a software solutions provider for utilities and airports. Gentrack has witnessed a stronger than expected revenue in the second half of financial year 21 across the utilities segment. And GTK ended the day 1.6% in the red to close at $1.77. GTK shares delivered a year to date return of 28.57%. Bottom line, with technological innovations rising at a supercharged speed, tech stocks are expected to do well as companies are increasingly automating and fulfilling digital needs of companies and people. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Kalkine's latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, do head to the website, it's kalkinemedia.com and my name is Sage for Kalkine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and MBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Hello, Gilles here for Calkine TV. Welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we share with you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest business insights. Today we're joined by Mr. Manish Chopra of Healthy Health Tech Pioneers at Shifa Care, the multi-user and multilingual healthcare ecosystem that uses AI epidemiology, genetic sequencing driven by prediction, and much more. Welcome to the show, Manish. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Hello. How are you? And good afternoon to viewers. Hi there. Great to have you on. First of all, a congratulations is in order. Shifa Care was the winner of Top 50 Companies Advancing Healthcare by IA. 
IFAH, sorry, 2019. What are the key drivers of the success? So, uh, I was heading up Asia Pacific for number one pharmaceutical and I saw this enormous gap in access to uh, people are spending more money on travel to see a doctor than actual cost treatment. And that's where I was born. And we were awarded the most progressive healthcare company because we are the only platform where you can choose a doctor who speaks your language out of hundred languages and another specialist who speaks your language. And you can get the medical consultation from your phone. And That's incredible. This way, one doctor. Sorry, just having some audio issues there. That's incredible. Did you say it was 100 languages or somewhere about that uh, yes. a customer could choose from? 100 languages. That is amazing. Obviously, very well serviced there. Now, online medical consultation, consultation sorry, have seen a spike like no other time in the past few months. How has Shifacare risen to the challenge of increased demand in this phase? So Shifa picked up the market signal very early. Uh, the matter of fact is it was illegal in Australia pre-COVID to have a teleconsultation. And we already launched the program in India and now we're working with the Medicare uh, to launch in Australia. That's really interesting. It was illegal, did you say? Correct. Mm -hmm. You cannot be bulk billed as a patient on Medicare to consult a doctor over the phone. And any prescription generated over the phone do not have legal standing. Very interesting. And um, how recently has that law changed? So that changed in March. And e-prescription is mandatory in Australia from November this year. So paper prescription will go all out. So no more paper prescription. Wow, that's really interesting. That must have been a really big change to the industry. Uh, it is a big change. Uh, however, uh, the consumer awareness uh, have not been created by government and the regulatory bodies. We would like to see a campaign because if November is around the corner and if there will be no paper prescription, all moms and dads like they used to for the paper prescription and just saying you will have the 2d barcode prescription on your phone some people don't have a phone and we have not seen in, in, in the mainstream the awareness of that change all right that's obviously quite concerning indeed now you deal with telemedicine in your app could you tell us about some of the key features on this app so one of the most uh, critical thing we saw, we did our market research, 30 to 40% people over 65 in Australia, they do not speak English at home as a native language. And that is a significant barrier to healthcare. So first thing we conquered was Yes, I live in Australia. However, if I want to speak to a Punjabi specialist who's, who's fluent in Punjabi, uh, I should be able to search it, uh, regardless of distance. Uh, it's Melbourne. And one must know India is the largest exporter of doctors around the world. So you will find a language uh, which is suitable to you, and you'll find a doctor who speaks your language. So we made it multilingual. Absolutely. Second thing That's... was like, yep. Sorry, continue. Second thing was, say, I'm working in Sydney and my mom lives in Orange or Double uh, in a country, Australia, yeah? And she is visiting an oncologist. Current scenario is I have to take time off uh, to be with her and go to oncologist and ask the questions and the treatment plan and the progressive nature of the. Now, we made it multi-user. So means you can have more than one doctor and more than one family member on there. It's five ways. So I'll give you a scenario. 
So mum will go to local GP in Orange. So she do not need to travel to Sydney anymore. GP will connect to the oncologist in Sydney. I will be on that call as well as son or carer or parer. So I can pay for mum's treatment or I can be a carer and, and have access to the health records. So this way, all four people on one call make a treatment plan and move. And that makes it because I'm still in my office. I been with my mom's oncologist. I spoke to the GP. GP have translated that to mom. And mom is nice and easy at home. So that that's important. Third thing is Shifa Australia will be fully bulk billed by Australian Medicare. So each time you make an appointment, you do not need to worry about how I'll pay or anything. As long as your Medicare number is well, you will be connected to a doctor you want, and you will get a e prescription which you can send to it, or we can help you deliver. So someone who's really sick, last thing you want to do in the Corona time, especially in the community. So that will be happening. Right, that's incredible. It sounds like you've really um, opened up the, the lines of last communication. Last one you will love this, Holly, in there as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And last one is you make an appointment with Daya, and you every five minutes to see a GP. We have taken that barrier out. We, the algorithm in there, it will connect you to, to first of all, Australia wide. So you choose out of 22,000 GPs, and I am pretty confident, all busy at the So next available GP will be with you in Kent. That's you incredible. Have your script done, and that is it. From your car, where? That's amazing. It sounds like you've made the process very efficient indeed. We have to because look all other industries, yeah. At Amazon, it do it what you bought, what you did, what your payment preferences are, what your preferred address is, all those kind of clicks, what you watch, what you may like kind of healthcare have in still eighties where people were dying with cholesterol and high blood pressure. It's not the case anymore. Cholesterol is a lifestyle disease these days, rather than being a disease which used to cause heart attacks. And health tech, somewhere, there is a hesitancy to get into it because of the regulatory requirements. So technology companies are not investing into it. Uh, more people will come in this. There's a, a lot more to do. Uh, we will talk later on about those things. but. I strongly believe technology can significantly improve the access to healthcare. Mm. Right. Very interesting point. You mentioned technology, and I know you work with AI as well. Do you think that AI is the future of medicine? If it is perhaps the future of medicine, how so do you think? We take or I strong AI significant in medicine. The reason for that is the doctor you consult today went to university probably in the 70s. From then till now, they would have attended continuous education program once or twice a year. But millions of new clinical trials published. There is no capacity of human brain can consume the amount of clinical literature available on this planet. Only AI can do that. It can be a very tool for the years of learning. Absolutely, I completely agree. That's a very good point. Obviously, the human brain is definitely limited, and obviously, human error plays a big factor in some medical error as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And the point on AI is uh, we will be seeking in future uh, 
when a patient connects to the doctor via a video call, yeah? Taking your temperature signature, if your skin tone, it will be capturing your voice signature. And it will have your base features. And when next time you in flu and talking to a doctor, or you have an attack, you're talking to a doctor and you got some wheezing that changes your noise signature of your breathing, AI will suggest the doctor, look, it's a 95% match to asthma symptoms or 98% match to a flu symptom. And that will assist doctor to make a improved diagnosis rather than just going on to gut feel. Very good point. So they're obviously working together, the AI and human capabilities there to deliver the best service possible. Absolutely. And if someone is planning to send kids to the school for med school, uh, probably I will not suggest that. <laughs> good point. Now, speaking of smart healthcare, what are the challenges that you're noticing in smart healthcare in Australia and how can they be addressed? The smart healthcare is breaking the change and it's making all about the individuals. It comes to the doctors or the patients. Yeah? So currently, if you look at in the healthcare system, uh, it's funny, we don't observe that. As a patient, you are paying for it, yeah? However, the choices for your treatment are made by someone else who is receiving money, and dispensing choices of the medicine are made by someone else who is receiving your money. As a consumer, you have no choice. That's the biggest challenge. And I think if I pay for something, I must have a choice what treatment I will seek as well as what treatment choice I will get. And Technology will do that, smart healthcare will do that, because I will not be limited to a GP in my suburbia when I can have access to 22,000 GPs in Australia. I can read reviews, I can see their customer service. And that's an important point. In med school, they do not teach customer service, how to deal with patients, with communication skills. It's all about medicine, 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 and smart healthcare will change that. Very good point, and that's obviously a very welcome change because there is obviously a need for customer service even in the medical sphere as well. Now you yep. talk about ADMs, that is automatic dispensing machines for the viewers that don't know. Could you tell us a bit more about it? That's my life's vision. Uh, uh, ADMs, I call them, and uh, automated dispensing machines. I see their role because if you want to fill your script, say 8 o'clock at night, that's where your shift work finished. You cannot. And that's unacceptable in 21st century. Like you do not have access to doctor and you do not have access to a pharmacy. Yeah. ADMs will dispense your medicine with your e-prescription on your phone on every single corner, like a Coke or Pepsi machine. And there will be a virtual touch screen available. If you want to speak to a pharmacist, you can request pharmacists on demand and those pharmacists might be working from home. They log on to the portal and when the job comes, they appear. It does not limit by the geography, area, day or night. You, you can choose to work one hour, two hour, five hours a day. So it's, it's a win-win for everyone. And also ADMs being a network, uh, I invested almost 5,000 ADMs in Australia in the next, next 10 years. The cost of procurement will be so advanced, so you will be getting the finest medicine on a very cost-effective price. Right, which would be absolutely revolutionary, obviously. How far away do you think we are from that development? Uh, we, we have the prototype. Uh, however, we are uh, seeking funding after the Medicare launch in Australia. And we'll start with a pilot probably in 2024 because uh, one should remember the accuracy need to be 100%. So when I say 100% means it's not the machine dispenses 1,000 times out of 1,000 times the correct medicine. That's not 100% in medicine. It has to be 100 million times out of 100 million times it dispenses the medicine correctly. That's where the accuracy need to be. 
and only artificial intelligence will do that. I would like to make a point there as well, like current role of pharmacist is there because pharmacists do not get the appropriate labeling on the medicine. So they have to put extra stickers on that need to change as well. Because if a medicine makes you sleepy, that's the correct characteristic of that medicine is. So it should come with the pre-printed label on it rather than a human being standing there and then putting the label on and it's costing money to taxpayers. A very good point. It's obviously all about the cost effectiveness down the line as well. And that's something that idioms, as you mentioned, will probably reduce. So that is excellent to hear. And hopefully we do see that roll out in the near future. I think it was 2024, did you mention? Yes. Well, hopefully it's a bit sooner than that. Fingers crossed on that uh, note, though. Technologies are there. Okay. Technologies are there. Uh, I, I visited Amazon's warehouse in Japan. Uh, no, no single person whatsoever. And they manage 2 million SKUs, 2 million items. And it, it does everything by itself. So technology is out there. It's just a matter of fact is adoption, uh, making it right and getting the regulatory approvals. And then we are on. Very good point. Well, hopefully, hopefully that is still sooner than anticipated, though. On that note, it's just about all we have time for today. Thank but you. I've got to uh, say, we, we, we think so as well. Great to hear. Yes. And I've got to say thanks so much for joining our show today. It's been really good to hear insights. Pleasure to have you on. Viewers, if you've just joined us, we've had a stellar discussion with Mr. Manish Chapra of Shifa Care. You can catch this edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on the Calkine channel later today. But for now, thanks for your time and stay tuned to Calkine TV for more live updates. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? 
Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency. On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear stand. If contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello, I'm Rachel and you're watching Kalkine TV live from Sydney. This is the Stocks in Action show. Shares of Collins Foods, a publicly listed Australian company focused on restaurant operations, were trading up today. That's after the company announced that one of its wholly owned subsidiaries, Collins Food Netherlands Management, has signed an agreement with KFC in Europe. KFC Europe's a wholly owned subsidiary of the Yum Brands. The agreement signed for the appointment of Collins Foods as KFC's corporate franchisee in the Netherlands under a corporate franchise agreement. Under that agreement, Collins Foods will develop, manage, market, support and operate KFC business in the Netherlands. That's including the introduction, management and oversight of existing and future franchisees. Up to 130 new KFC restaurants will be developed in the Netherlands over the next 10 years. The agreement will be effective from the 31st of December and will be for an initial term of five years. Shares of Australian conglomerate West Farmers are trading up today. That's after the company acquired a 19.3% stake in health and beauty company Australian Pharmaceutical Industries represented by 95.1 million of API shares. The acquisition was completed under the undertaking agreement entered in July with the investment firm Washington H. Sol Pattinson & Company. West Farmers is, however, looking to acquire a proposed 100% stake in API by way of scheme of arrangement. It's progressing with its confirmatory due diligence for the proposal. West Farmers believe that its proposal is superior to that offered by pharmacy distribution business Sigma Healthcare to API in September. West Farmers, therefore, does not intend to use its acquired 19.3% stake to support or vote in favour of the Sigma proposal. The investment by the company is set to strengthen the competitive position of API and its community pharmacy partners. The current acquisition price for West Farmers was $1.38 for each API share. In addition, they will make further payments to Washington H. Sol Patterson and Company that receives total consideration per API share equivalent to that paid under any successful West Farmers acquisition of API. Shares of healthcare company MRI were trading up as the company reported today that it had been invited to participate in the second cohort of Planetier's Foundry Builders program. This was initiated to enable selected companies to access robust and highly secure data integration analysis software exclusively available to significant enterprises. Under the program, MRI will have access to the full Planetier Foundry stack greatly enhancing Amaria's data infrastructure, security, integration and analysis capabilities. Planetier Foundry will now form the backbone of Amaria's proprietary real-world evidence asset 
and Accelerate at Maria's data-guided drug development programs targeting FDA and TGA registrations. Well, after that now, it's time for a very short break. Stay tuned for more trending updates. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello and welcome back. I'm Rachel live from Sydney and you're watching the Stocks in Action show. Shares of a modular car parking business parked are trading flat so far today. The company reported that it's registered parked construction as its new building contractor subsidiary in Western Australia and has employed registered building practitioner Simon Amos as general manager of construction. The new entity forms an important role in the development of Park to act as a head contractor to partner with other builders, subcontractors and its supply chain for the delivery of projects under industry standard contractual agreements. Simon Amos has held executive positions in Tier 1 building companies including John Holland, Broad Construction, BGC POSCO and at Fastbrick Robotics. He's also involved in the delivery of the City Subaru project four parked. Moving on, and health technology company Cardiax, their shares are trading up so far today. The company announced that its subsidiary global health technology company Connect has signed a manufacturing and development partnership agreement with Fender Technology for its wearable product called the Connect Band. Fender is a Chinese manufacturer of smart wearables and wireless solutions. The agreement formalizes the pre-existing relations between Fender and Connect. Fender will take over the manufacturing activities related to the Connect band. Connect, on the other hand, will provide creative design and product specifications. It will also drive promotion and sales of wearable devices. Other news coming in about the strategic collaboration between Connect and LifeQ, which is a leading biometrics and health information provider from wearable devices. With this agreement, Cardiex is expanding its footprint in China in anticipation of Connect wearables. Next up, Q Holdings. Shares of ASX-listed logistics firm Cube are down so far today. The company reported on the 7th of October that the Competition Regulator, Australian Commission and Consumer Competition will conduct an investigation into potential competition issues arising from Cube's completed acquisition of the Newcastle Agri-Terminal. The company had notified the ACCC last month and then later finished the transaction on the 30th of September. That's despite requests from the ACCC to postpone completion of the transaction after the market participants had raised competition concerns. They stated that the Australian regulator was not provided with adequate information to examine the competitive impact of the transaction. The potential competition concerns which have been raised relate to the position that Cube will now hold for the delivery of bulk grain to the port of Newcastle. The company reported that it's now inviting submissions from the participants who've expressed concerns about that acquisition. Well, that's all for now. That's a wrap for the show. Keep watching Calkine TV for more trending market updates. I'm Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. 
exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators and journalists. Plus we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calcine TV. Good morning, you're watching Expert Talks here on Kalkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs and today we're going to be speaking with Leon Werfel, CEO of Bueno. This is a show where we interview industry leaders and experts in their fields to inspire you to invest wisely and optimise your own potential. Bueno is derived from the keywords built environment optimization and is the Australian leader in data and information driven operational property services. Bueno delivers superior data related and technology driven services based on fault detection, optimization and business intelligence. Let's meet Leon Werfel, the founder and CEO of Bueno. Good morning, Leon. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, recently, I have to say, you were presented with the ARBS Young Achiever Award and named the Climate Control Industry Rising Star. That's a pretty amazing achievement. How does that one feel? That feels really good. Um, uh, the ARBS uh, body has been pretty uh, kind to us. They also uh, recognised us with the product of the year last year, so we're really proud of that recognition that they've given us. No doubt. Um, now, Bueno has experience across a range of facilities, including commercial buildings, shopping centres, hospitals, hotels, supermarkets and entertainment complexes. There's not a lot missing there, but what are, you, what are the engineering services that you provide? Yeah, so I might uh, take a step back and talk to you about our purpose first. So our purpose is to realise the, uh, realise the dream of a sustainable world through data. And uh, we are focused on realising that dream and um, doing it via data in the property industry. The way that we, um, the way that we uh, uh, are working towards our purpose is by uh, making the property operation, making the property industry evolve to be more data driven in their operations. Um, that means taking uh, work, uh, you know, workflows, tasks, etc., that are usually driven by calendars, um, you know, monthly checks, quarterly checks, etc and instead using our software to inform um, the property industry by insights, what actions to take, um, you know, what equipment to fix, what equipment to make run more efficiently, um, based on the data from the instrumentation that already exists in, in, in those, um, that, that engineering equipment. Um, we've got a couple of products uh, across analytics, um, uh, insights, we've got an independent data layer. We also provide managed services to help customers uh, wherever they are along their journey. And like you said, across many different verticals. I think you've raised a really vital point there by saying let's first talk about the purpose. Would you say that that's really vital in any new um, organisation or startup to have that really strong sense of purpose and goal? Oh, 100%, 100%. It, it is really the first filter that you put over any decision that you make for your company. Um, so we, we always try and take things back to that's brilliant. And of course, always coming back to that purpose along every step as you go, no doubt. Definitely. So moving on to the next question, your services are, as you've said, data driven and powered by analytics technology. Can you tell us about the other systems for which Bueno has developed analytics? Yeah, we, we have analytics uh, and, and, our, and our product is mature across a number of different engineering services. Um, you know, we've, we do business with seven out of the 10 biggest um, real estate investment trusts in Australia. So we're obviously very familiar with your office buildings, uh, your shopping centers and the types of systems that you would you find within those buildings. So we're, um, and we're also across, um, you know, Woolies, Woolworths is our biggest customer. So we're also across uh, grocery, very, very deep into refrigeration, et cetera. But I might turn that question around a little bit and talk about the different value streams rather than the different systems, um, because that's an interesting lens to put over um, put over any kind of technology solution. You know, what do you want to get out of it? 
So in terms of energy optimization, we have uh, our solution uh, works across HVAC, BMS, and energy metering, as well as refrigeration. Uh, in terms of operational uh, optimization, level of service delivery, uh, maintenance quality, etc. Um, uh, you know, we as, as per the previous systems, but we can also throw in other systems like vertical transport, uh, et cetera, into the mix. Um, for risk management, um, you know, we, we also do uh, a lot of work in water treatment and, and devices. So you mentioned risk man management. I um, can only imagine what has been happening during the current climate with the COVID situation, particularly with some of your major clients. Can you give us an insight as to how you've been able to work around this at this stage? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of buildings that haven't had many people in them. And so, you know, we've really been relying on the data instead as our first line of defence for understanding what's going on in these buildings because we're missing the feedback that we would normally get from the occupants of the building. And the first line of the defence is when someone is unhappy with how the building, the level, the level of comfort, or, or even sees a, a leak or it's an issue with their own eyeballs. Um, so yeah, we've had to rely on the data, uh, first and foremost, above the people. And since, since the pandemic started, we've built a lot of you know, what we've described as uh, caretaker functionality into our platform so that as buildings aren't occupied, um, they, they are still operated in a way that lets them be reoccupied without any helps and, and minimises their energy consumption when they're in that unoccupied mode as well. I can imagine that that's something that will be paving the way for the future as I'm sure there will be scenarios where these um, staff members are working from home in the future for many, many years to come regardless of the current pandemic. Uh, definitely. And what, what was really interesting is that when the pandemic started, the area that we were getting the most interest from was New York City, which was one of the hardest hit, um, hardest hit uh, places in the world, you know, going back to April last year. And it was because of that very reason, because people wanted to have a remote uh, monitoring capability for their buildings, not being able to get technicians into them as easily as they used to be. Indeed. So now some may argue that sustainability is a new and somewhat immature industry and that it could be missing many systems that other industries use to automate and improve outcomes. How do you plan to accelerate the proliferation of new systems and ideas throughout the property and sustainability industries? That's, that's a really good point. And uh, unfortunately, the property uh, sector is uh, and the intersection of property and sustainability sits um, with, uh, you know, a pretty fledgling industry, which is sustainability, and also um, the property industry, which is actually the worst adopter of technology out of any industry in the world. And you marry that up with the fact that the property industry is responsible for, say, 40% of um, global carbon emissions. You, you have uh, uh, you know, a, a situation where one of the biggest, um, one, of, one of the industries that has the biggest impact is also not um, you know, not doing its part to, to operate itself the most productively and use resources the most productively. So that's a problem on one side, but um, on the other side, it means there's a huge amount of opportunity to, uh, to improve the way that things are working. So you've highlighted that analytics alone doesn't instantly improve the building performance, but rather it's the successful resolution of identified issues over time, be it through that human identification or uh, data identification, and that produces the long-term positive outcomes. What aspects other than the analytics should most property businesses start prioritising? I mean, you can't forget about the people. And you can't forget about the people and you've got to realize that um, as you're adopting new technologies and new tools uh, people are going to have to find different ways of working to get the most out of that technology and um, that means you need to get out ahead of the change management that you're going to need to the change management issues that you're going to need to address across your organization because at the end of the day you know you can you can uh, deploy all the technology and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning you know insert whatever technology buzzword here um, uh, if you don't have engagement with people and if you don't uh, help them be empowered to get the most out of these new tools, then you, you just won't get the app. I can certainly see why you've been identified and, and rewarded for being such a young leader and pioneer in your field. So, Leon, in your opinion, what is the role of predictive maintenance and artificial intelligence in the growth of the intelligent building industry? I think that, as you've um, correctly pointed out, the industry has a long way to go. Um, uh, 
And but at the same time, there's a, a huge amount of opportunity to be able to do things better within the industry. Um, having said that, I think people get uh, are very excited about the hype and the the buzzwords and um, you know the, the the potential when they really should be getting the basics right first. I think that um, all of these you know more sophisticated, more advanced technologies have you know really useful, really powerful specific use cases. But eighty percent of the benefits come from you know getting these basic right basics right, which is really just using technology to help do what people are already doing, but help them do that a lot better, a lot more productively. And as you said at the very beginning of the chat, that would really be about maintaining your integrity and bringing it back to what is the ultimate purpose. Would you agree with that? Yes, 100%. Wonderful. Well, Leon Werfel, CEO of Bueno, thank you for your time today, and we hope to chat with you again soon. Thank you. And that's all from Expert Talks here on Calkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs and make sure you stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine TV. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Calkine has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of Calkine's latest videos. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for joining us. Today we're bringing you what makes CKB such a viable crypto for investors. The Nervos Network is an open source blockchain ecosystem which has been on a high of late. It has had a good run with the market, especially with the altcoin boom, and is considered to be one of the strongest tokens to invest. It is governed by its native token CKB and it allows the crypto asset to be stored with the security and immutability. Being permissionless, it enables smart contracts and layer 2 scaling and aims to capture the total network value through its store value. The investors can hop on to the bullish run that the token has witnessed of late and with a foundation for a universal internet like public network, it can help investors to expand their crypto portfolios. Being decentralised in nature, investing in Nervos is like investing in the next step in blockchain evolution. So why is CKB crypto unique? The CKB token acts as an effective inflation hedge and allows the investors to make sure that they can minimize the risk of losing money in a bearish market. Besides this, users can mine the token and earn sustainable incentives in the process. With the store of the value, the users can lock their tokens for the long run and tokens never get diluted beyond a fixed cap. This ensures that the liquidity is maintained in the long run and ensures that there are enough buyers and sellers in the market. Is CKB a good investment? CKB is ranked 4,265 on CoinMarketCap. At British Summertime 12 p.m., CKB was up by 1.45% in the last 24 hours. CKB has a live market cap of US approximately $387.48 million with a maximum supply of 28.08 billion CKB coins. And according to wallet investors, CKB is one of the profitable investments which crypto enthusiasts can consider. 
Not only is it having a bullish trend, if one invests 100 US in Nervos Network, then one can expect returns to be around 348.25% higher in the next five years. In fact, this year's prediction itself is pretty bullish, with experts predicting the price to reach US 0.0226 by the end of this year itself. And in the recent announcement of Nervos Network integrating both its testnet and mainnet with Covalent, it would well be providing a platform for it to take on and expand itself. With it running on Ethereum virtual machine along with its compatibility with Nervos CKB, it would make the data highly reliable and quantifiable. And thanks for joining us in the report. If you do like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on this crypto or other cryptos you'd like us to report on. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. But for more information and regular updates, do head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. And this is Sage for Calkine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Hello everyone, Sage again and welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Today's guest is Dr. Richard Hames, a Senior Policy Advisor for the New Liberals Political Party. And working within a democratic preferential voting system, the votes given to the minor parties can have a major impact on the major parties, especially in the Senate. And today's guest will share insights from the newly registered political party, the New Liberals. So we're very lucky to have Mr. Sorry, Dr. Richard Hames, Senior Policy Advisor for the New Liberals, with us today. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you too. And let's get started. The New Liberals aim to base Australia's economic development on policies of incentive, not of subsidy. How does this relate to the New Liberals Party's belief that GDP growth should not be the only metric to base national prosperity on, especially in the times of national deficit that we're currently in, please? <laughs> okay, good question. Bear in mind that uh, uh, this is a new party, so we're formulating policy as we go prior to the election, and I'm not an economist. But um, in terms of that question, uh, we believe that the, but GDP is actually uh, not, a, not a good uh, measure on a number of different counts. Uh, 
and a lot of the policy that we're devising at the moment is really based not on neoclassic economics but on modern monetary policy uh, and also part of that is avoiding that trap between governments needing to run surpluses or deficits or whatever it is there's this this belief that uh, the government always has to be in surplus which is a nonsense and in times like this when the economy is being ravaged by the pandemic governments actually need to spend it's the only way to incentivize the economy and so we're looking at various ways we can do that that's very interesting. Thank you so much. I think when you go to America, you can see the national debt in numbers, and the number is very, very long. But it's very true what you say, that the financial model, the economic system that we work in, doesn't really have to or need a surplus. I mean, the whole thing is based on the Federal Reserve creating debt out of the quantitative easing. So it's a very interesting point that you raised there. Um, mm. How does the new Liberals Party aim to establish a simple and just tax system which guarantees that all persons and all entities will pay their fair share? Will it involve changes to superannuation? We've seen that the US President Joe Biden is making waves with his monetary policy requiring more tax from people earning over $400,000. How will the net or the high net individuals and corporations be impacted? I think probably considerably. Uh, I, I don't see that we can go on living the way we have. If you look at the socio-economic stratification that is giving rise to this widening gap between the ultra-wealthy and the poor, you begin to realize that every billionaire is a policy mistake. So what we need to do is try and make the tax system more equitable. Part of that is in ensuring that corporations that uh, operate in Australia pay their fair share of tax in Australia. And actually the G7 right at this moment are looking at ways to enforce perhaps something like a 15% tax on corporates um, in every jurisdiction where there is business done. The other thing we need to do is to make sure that corporates don't shelter behind uh, transfer pricing schemes and, and such. The, the, the other interesting thing I would mention here is that we want to put two things. We want to put more money into the hands of ordinary men and women, not the banks, not the major corporations, but to revitalize the economy through that. And it's not just in America. I mean, you, you note what's happening in America and Joe Biden's policy in, in taxing uh, wealthy people but this is even happening in china now you know the reverse uh, philosophy but it's still something that there, this reversal of wealth needs to be looked at by by all economies everywhere yes that is interesting the proliferation of the middle class um it it is quite sad that half the world's wealth is held by only one percent of the population so if something mm. can be done to somehow create more liquidity in the economy so it's the benefit of all involved that would be great um thank you for it needs to be more access. equitable certainly definitely yes and australia is an interesting country it's gone from having one of the lowest uptakes of the COVID 19 <coughs> vaccine to now having one of the highest inoculation rates in a matter of months because possibly of more exposure to active cases. And the federal government is also offering vaccine doses to the neighboring island nations. The last time a vaccine was mandatory in Australia was for smallpox. And it does yeah. seem that the discussed freedom plan involves somewhat of a compulsory vaccination. What is the new Liberal Party's view on this, please? The, again, we're in another trap here, and it's the trap between individual agency which is the right wing of politics, if you like, the, the right of the individual to have freedom and pursue rights, uh, freedom of expression uh, and to pursue business. And, and that philosophy obviously underpins our economy in Australia, as it does in all Western economies. And on the other hand, that, that need also to connect with people and community. Um, we fall into the trap of yo-yoing between one or the other. 
it's either the, the left in power or the right in power. And I think the new liberals want to try and craft a more artful governance where we look at the data from both sides and try to have a middle ground that is sensible, that doesn't shut down the economy, that allows people to freely express um, uh, their own individuality and their, their, their intelligence in understanding how best to look after their own health and well-being, and at the same time make sure that um, the, the community as a whole doesn't suffer. I, I, don't, I don't think we're heading uh, towards compulsory vaccination for everybody. But certainly when I started to travel, and I'm, I'm old, but when I started to travel, I, I had to have a vaccination passport for yellow fever and uh, malaria and things like that. It was perfectly common. True, true, very true. And thank you for sharing your own experience there. So. Australia's government has not yet been able to pledge net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we're moving on quite quickly from issue to issue, but that's only because yeah. of our 10 minute time slot. Mm -hmm. um, solar energy in Australia is booming and the recent federal budget has allocated a large amount of money to developing renewable energy production partners in order to make the space more cost effective, especially after Australia's black summer fire season last year. How are the new Liberals planning on keeping Australia on track with the global climate change goals, please? Uh, so more investment in renewables, obviously, and solar is the most important of those. Bringing the date to 2030 to make sure that we become more ingenious and more imaginative in how we can create investments. There's also a, a, a situation developed here. Uh, I'm sorry to keep talking about the traps that we're in. But Western governments generally and governments all around the world are focused on uh, the reduction of emissions of greenhouse gases. And, uh, in the short, in the long term, that's very, very important indeed, because at the moment we're running at about somewhere between 416 and 420 units of carbon in the air, um, which is not good at all. We need to do things faster. But we also need to understand that emissions isn't the be all and end all of the problem. Global warming is driving us over planetary boundaries such as loss of species, loss of biodiversity, ocean acidific uh, acidification and things like that. And and so it's warming that's driving um, those things. So we need to pay attention to how we slow warming. And the new liberals will be looking at policies that examine industrial agriculture, for example, perhaps to reduce uh, the amount of beef and dairy we produce, not entirely, but to reduce that. And also perhaps even to look at geoengineering projects such as sun reflection that can actually buy us time to get to the kind of levels of emissions zero that we need. Right, thank you so much for sharing your prospectus there. And we're on to our final question now as we wind up the discussion. The new Liberal Party also has a strong stance on refugees seeking solace in Australia and unfortunately this issue is pulsing again and with the recent developments of terrorism in Afghanistan. Do the new Liberals support the actions of the Morrison government in offering refugee visas to Afghan athletes and could they be doing more for those Australian permanent residents and citizens who are stuck in Afghanistan please? Uh, yes, we believe we can do more, uh, but we can only do more if we first look at the situation through a humanitarian lens rather than a security lens. We have to remember that a nation like Australia was built on immigration and productivity, our productivity in Australia is tied to immigration. And so it's absolutely critical, not just from an economic point of view, but also from a humanitarian point, that we do as much as we can for refugees, not just in Afghanistan, but wherever they are. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your insights again. That's actually all the time we have for in today's time slot. Was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close up the discussion? Just think very carefully about how you vote leading up to the next election. I mean, we we're in trouble, we're in dire straits and I believe the New Liberals is a socially progressive party but economically responsible as well so 
look carefully to how you vote. Thank you, and every vote does count. And best of luck with your near-term pipeline goals and the party's future in general. Thank you so much. And viewers, if you, you've just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion with Dr Richard Haynes, a senior policy advisor for the New Liberals, a newly registered Australian political party. And if you'd like to watch the full discussion, please head to our YouTube channel, Calkine Media, where you will find it there. And please stay watching for more expert talks and live market commentaries. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello and good afternoon. I'm James Preston reporting live from Kalkine Studio. It's lunchtime here in Sydney and it's time for the Mid-Market Pulse. In today's show we'll take a look at the biggest winners and losers of the day. We'll also take a look at headline making stocks such as Collins Food and Sezzle. But let's begin with an overview of today's overall Australian share market performance by the mid-trade session. Australian shares continued to trade higher by the afternoon with most sectors higher, led by technology and telecom stocks. The market sentiment was lifted by firm cues from Wall Street, which ended higher overnight amid hopes that the Congressional Democrats and Republicans can reach a deal to avoid a debt default. The benchmark index, the ASX 200, traded higher by 0.71% up to lunch. The index opened much higher today, tracking firm cues from US stocks and gained as much as 0.72%. In the overnight trade, US stocks settled higher on the hopes of a debt ceiling limit extension. The stocks fell in opening deals after robust private jobs data raised concerns that the Federal Reserve could roll back economic stimulus soon. The Dow Jones Industrial Average settled with a 0.3% gain, while the S&P 500 also rose by 0.3%. The Nasdaq Composite added 0.5%. Back home on the sectoral front, 9 of 11 sectoral indices were trading in positive terrain. The tech sector was the best performer with a 2.1% gain, following firm cues from its US counterpart, the Nasdaq. The tech sector was followed by Telecom, which also rose by 0.9. Among others, A REITs, healthcare, consumer discretionary and financials also saw a surge in buying. Bucking the trend, the energy sector was the biggest loser with a 1.3% loss, followed by materials which traded marginally lower. On the COVID-19 front, New South Wales had 587 new cases in the past 24 hours. Victoria's daily case tally also continued to outnumber New South Wales by rising to 1,638 on Thursday. Let's now turn our attention to the top gainers and losers by mid-session trade. The top gainer on the ASX pack was Aussie retailer Super Retail Group, which rose by 7.2% by the afternoon trade. Some of the other notable gainers were KFC operator Collins Foods, financial services firm Hub24, drug maker Kleinuval Pharmaceuticals and healthcare equipment business Polynovo. On the losing side, Australian coal miner Whitehaven Coal topped the losers chart with a 6.4% loss. Travel business C-Link Travel Group, gaming and entertainment group Star Entertainment Energy major Santos and gold miner Chalice Mining were also among the big losers. Time now for a very short break on Calkine TV and on the other side of these messages we take a look at stocks that have been making headlines on the mid-market polls. Hi, I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV.
Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Welcome back to Kalkine TV. Great to have your company for the Mid-Market Pulse. I'm James Preston. Let's now take a look at shares that are in the headlines today, beginning with Collins Foods. Shares of Collins Foods rose over 5% after signing an agreement to become the corporate franchisee for the KFC chain in the Netherlands. The company said in an exchange filing that it has inked a pact with KFC Europe, a wholly owned subsidiary of Yum. That's for the appointment of Collins Foods as KFC's corporate franchisee in the Netherlands. Collins Foods will develop, manage, market and support and operate the KFC business in the Netherlands, including the introduction, management and oversight of existing and future franchises. The agreement sets out a framework for the development of up to 130 new KFC restaurants in the Netherlands over the next 10 years. Shares of Super Retail Group climbed over 7% following a ratings upgrade. The share price rose after global brokerage firm UBS upgraded the stock to a buy, citing that the retailer is likely to benefit from a strong rebound after lockdowns come to an end. Let's now turn our attention to Australian conglomerate West Farmers. Their shares traded marginally higher after the acquisition of Washington H. Sol Pattinson's 19.3% stake in Australian pharmaceutical industries. Also, API shares rose over 2% following the announcement. Wes Farmers has purchased 95.1 million shares from Sol Pattinson under the terms of the undertaking agreement signed in July this year. The company in a statement said it remained committed to pursuing its proposal to acquire 100% of the API stake for cash consideration of one Aussie dollar and 55 cents per share, subject to certain conditions. West Farmers is progressing with its confirmatory due diligence investigations in support of its proposal. Moving on now to buy now, pay later firm Afterpay. Shares of, or should I say, OpenPay. Shares of OpenPay jumped nearly 10% after it secured a 372 million receivables warehouse facility from Goldman Sachs and Atalia Asset Management. The funding triples the company's existing credit facilities and includes just over 1 million warrants for fully paid ordinary shares in the company to be given to Goldman Sachs. The receivables warehouse facility will help the small cap fintech company to fuel its expansion into the US market. OpenPay looks to facilitate transactions for merchants and consumers in the US and lays the groundwork to support growth in the region. Another buy now pay later player, Sezzle, has gained at nearly 6% on its partnership with US retailer Target. The gains followed the launch overnight of a partnership with US retailer Target that was initially mooted to occur in June. And lastly, shares in Cube Holding traded lower following reports of an investigation by the competition watchdog, Australian Competition and Consumer or the ACCC. The agency has launched a probe into the company's acquisition of the Newcastle Agri Terminal. The deal was executed before the ACCC had a chance to review potential competition concerns. That's according to the government body in a release today. Well, that's a wrap for the Mid-Market Pulse. Stay tuned to Kalkine TV for the latest breaking news, market updates and more. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV.
Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Sage, again, and welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkai TV. And today's guest is Ms. Sophie Gerber, co-CEO of Sophie Grace, an Australian Securities and Investment Commission is continually running investigations into the major financial institutions in Australia to ensure a fair and just system is created for the Australian consumers. Hefty fines are imposed when they find companies to be non-compliant, which can have serious repercussions. And today's expert will share insights on running an Australian compliance and legal consultancy firm with clients across Australia and beyond. And their specialty is assisting firms establish and maintain a financial services business in Australia. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. So today we're very lucky to have Ms. Sophie Gerber on the show. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you very much for having me. Sorry, I'm um, a bit casual today because we're in lockdown in Sydney at the moment, so I'm not dressed up as much as usual. Totally understandable. And I hope you're coping with lockdown and working from home conditions. Yeah, it's not, not too bad. Lots to do, thankfully. So it keeps you distracted. Excellent. Well, let's keep you busy and hear some of those valuable insights um, that you can share with us about maintaining compliance in Australian financial businesses. Um, Thank you for joining us again. And would you please elaborate on the range of financial services that you offer at Sophie Grace, please? Yeah, so we are a consultancy based in Sydney. So we're a group of lawyers. Uh, we do, we have a firm that does compliance services as well as legal services. So we help people with establishing an Australian financial services license or a credit license or which is uh, for, for being a, issuer of loans, so lending out money to, to consumers, uh, or also being a, a mortgage broker. We also help people with their Austrac registration and compliance, so that uh, applies to AFSL and ACL holders, but it also applies to people who are doing remittance services, so sending money overseas, um, or being a digital currency exchange, so that digital currency is the term they use for the cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we help people with, with getting those registrations and then, or licenses, and then maintaining those registrations and licenses. For the AFSLs and ACLs, they're registered with ASIC, and ASIC has a lot of rules which mostly come under the Corporations Act or the uh, NCCP Act, and those, those, uh, those rules are, are voluminous, there's, there's lots of them, and they, they can be difficult to keep on top of. So, so we help our clients with um, implementing the, the policies and procedures uh, to, to stay on top of that. Exactly. What an important role you play in, in helping those businesses to stay compliant because things are continuously being updated and changing as the economy scales. And we've seen the emergence of cryptocurrencies, like you mentioned, and more mm. digitisation. So it's important that all the staff, as well as the managers, are all on top of the changes and are able to adapt. So on that note, could you give us your expert views, please, on the new trends in development finance through private capital? Yeah, so I think what we're seeing across the board in the market is that people are becoming much more aware of, of the impact of, of what they're investing in. And so the market is adapting to respond to that. So so people are much more interested in, in things, what, what they also call the ESG, so the environmental, uh, social and governance issues around um, their investments. So people are concerned uh, or take a view where they used to not take a view about tobacco, alcohol, um, environmental businesses that, that impact on uh, mining. So people have views on that and um, people want to see, see their investments put uh, into things that are aligned with their values. So what we're seeing from, from our business is that, that people are uh, wanting to start businesses that, that cater to those, those desires which are coming out in the market. 
Right. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And, and the insider's opinion is so important because you're working in the space every day and, and seeing the trends emerging and changing and the patterns that it's creating in the space. So in your opinion, how is the market doing currently for the new financial services businesses that are emerging and their establishment and structuring? Are they being able to sustain business during these times? Look, I think uh, the... The establishment of a, a funds management business is particularly difficult. Um, it's, uh, it's expensive and uh, if you haven't been involved in the market before, it can cost you a lot of money uh, to, to get started and then also to maintain uh, that business. So um, what we're seeing is that, that people, um, are, if they're wanting to enter into the market and they haven't been in it before, they're finding it um, much more difficult than they thought it would be but that also means that the cost of innovating and the cost of setting up these products where you don't have a, a big uh, infrastructure behind you um, it, it can be prohibitive and so the development of, of these types of products is, is being hampered by that but i think in the long run um, we'll see them thrive the other issue that we're seeing is that there's people who want to cater to these demands but but just aren't able to to do so at at this point um, because the, uh, they they don't fully understand the the deep meaning of of ESG and um, development finance, and so they might be trying to take shortcuts in that regard. Right, that's very interesting for you to bring up there. And ESG has been more in focus, especially in the mining um, sector, but it's interesting to see how it's also impacting the, the financial services industry as well. So in the world of cyberspace, how does Sophie Grace assist its clients for distribution and marketing, please? So the way we assist clients is, is that we're helping them to understand the new regime um, which is coming in uh, at the beginning of October, which is called the Design and Distribution Obligations uh, under ASIC. So that's a, that's a big one, which which is impacting on anyone who's distributing products to retail clients in Australia or from Australia. Uh, you have to be much more targeted in the way that, that you distribute your products. First of all, that way you create your products, making sure that they're, they're properly documented and targeted and then that you distribute your products in accordance with that. Uh, so we help people with understanding that. We also help people with marketing their products in the sense that we help them go through all the different criteria uh, that applies to um, the marketing of financial services products. So there's words you uh, need to be very careful about using. There's disclaimers which need to go on. There's uh, your, your license numbers which need to go on these documents. Um, if there's past performance issues um, mentioned in the uh, marketing materials, those also need to be covered off in the documentation uh, as well. So that we have a very big checklist of things that people need to keep in mind when they're marketing financial products. So yeah, there, there's quite a lot of work uh, that needs to be done checking marketing materials and uh, publications that, that firms put out before they go to market because otherwise uh, as you'll see if, if you follow the ASIC news, people do get in trouble for, for pro improperly marketing and distributing their products and for using the wrong words. Uh, misleading and deceptive conduct is another uh, key key issue that ASIC has a focus on. So um, yeah, we, we help our clients with, with making sure uh, they, they can stay out of trouble, trouble with their marketing and distribution of products. Yes, um, th th that's such an important role to play and I think it's interesting to see that some businesses are actually having a keen focus on making terms and conditions and things like product disclosure statements a bit more friendly and, and easier to read rather than just being pages and pages of black and white writing which can be a bit daunting for some people. So in the past yeah. one year, which industry has given you the maximum clientele and why in your opinion? Uh, look. Over the years we've been operating, it, it changes as consumer demand and, and the media shift. So we are seeing a lot of uh, cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin at the moment. People wanting to move into that space, either through setting up the cryptocurrency exchanges uh, or setting up a funds management business to help people 
um, with getting access to those products without actually directly purchasing the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency, because there's a lot of complications around a direct investment in those products. So, so people are looking to try and make it easier. Uh, we're seeing a lot of financial planners moving from from big institutions to, to setting up their own firms uh, and, and just general compliance and, and comprehension of, of just the, the sheer number of rules that I mentioned, that also keeps us particularly busy. But despite uh, COVID and, and the lockdowns and um, the, the major disruption that, that we've been seeing, there has been a lot of um, new demand for setting up businesses and, and licenses. So that's re been really promising. I think that there are some people who've taken the opportunity to, to reassess what they want to do and how they want to do it, which has seen um, seen us luckily have a, have a steady demand of um, people coming through for support with licensing. So we're very grateful for, for that, that we've been able to keep keep busy with, with attending to that demand. Uh, and they're just, as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of rules that are coming in. Uh, there's a big set of rules which are starting at the beginning of October. Uh, which are being implemented by ASIC. So just new rules as well. They they keep us particularly busy um, in the last 18 months. And I expect that that will be the same for the next 12 to 18 months, just helping people with processing those requirements. Okay, thank you so much for sharing those insights, especially about the new rules that are due to come out from ASIC. That's incredibly valuable. So if people out there running financial services business were wanting to get in touch with you or keep on top of these changes from ASIC, how would you suggest they do so just quickly before we wind up? Well, it depends, depends what you, how you like to communicate. So we've got a, a pretty good website where people can, can chat on the website. Uh, people are always answering the phone and emails. So yeah, we're, we're always happy to speak to people who who are involved in the space or want to get in the space. Uh, if we can't help people, we're, we're always pointing people in the direction of other people who, who are best suited to, to assisting them. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're here and, and we're happy, happy to assist people. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sophie, for making time for the show today. Really do appreciate Thank your you. insights. Great. Have a good day. Thank you. And viewers, if you've just joined us, we just had a very insightful discussion with Ms. Sophie Grace. Um, so Miss Sophie Gerber, I beg your pardon, the co-CEO of Sophie Grace and she runs a Australian compliance and legal consultancy firm. If you'd like to hear the full discussion regarding Sophie Grace's services, please head to YouTube, Kalkai Media, where you can gain it there later today. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV.
is World Tourism Day. And although unfortunately a large part of the year has gone by under lockdowns and travel restrictions, it's not all bad news because we've got the top four best ways for you to celebrate the day this year. So sit back, relax and come along for the ride through our itinerary list only on this edition of Travel Insights. In the travel industry, virtual reality is turning out to be an interesting medium to capture tourist destinations in a unique and immersive way. In fact, that's first on our list. Kick off your world tourism day by enjoying the finer things in life. Why not take a virtual stroll at the National Gallery of Victoria and immerse yourself in the art and artifacts of the gallery? You can even tune in to one of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's performances and be dazzled by the works of Beethoven and Bach. Top off your cultured experience with a virtual tour of the Sydney Opera House as well. Number two on our list, celebrate World Tourism Day by learning a language. There's no better way to prepare for your future's travels with all this spare time at home than to practice a language. Even if you don't become anywhere near fluent, the basics of a foreign language will help you get around and locals will appreciate your efforts. We all know how the French can be. There are plenty of language learning apps at your disposal to make the process a whole lot easier. In fact, some of them even allow you to make friends with people in other countries, which is great because there's no better way to learn a language than through natural conversation. The third way you can celebrate World Tourism Day this year might not be as fun, but why not take a moment to reflect on the responsibilities we have as tourists when traveling the world in this post-pandemic day and age? Start by embracing mindfulness through research and educating yourself on any existing regulations in place in the countries you want to visit. Remember to foster the expansion of the local industry by purchasing authentic and locally made souvenirs. Keep your trip sustainable by considering the environment around you and set a high priority for your safety and sanitation by constantly checking your health and cleanliness. And finally, on this big day, extend your support for people in the tourism sector who will greatly appreciate it since they've been pretty vulnerable recently. A lot of livelihoods depend on the industry, so think about doing them a favor by sharing and promoting the destinations in need. These small actions can help many in the tourism workforce through the struggles of the pandemic. Sometimes selfless actions are the best way to celebrate such an exceptional day. And that concludes our list of things to do on World Tourism Day this year. So stick with us to hear from a very special guest, the founders of this special day itself. Don't go anywhere. Morning pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
everyone. Great to have your company here on Kalkine TV. I'm Rachel and you're watching Buzzing Trends. In today's show, we're looking at ASX-listed tech dividend stocks. The first company on our radar today is Dicadata, Australia's leading locally owned and operated distributor of information and communications, technology, hardware, software, cloud and Internet of Things solutions for reseller partners. The company made its ASX debut in 2011, and since 2017, the company's constantly provided dividends to its shareholders. In the first half of financial year 2021, the company announced a fully frank dividend of $0.09 cents per share paid on the 1st of September. Total revenue increased 21.3%. EBITDA improved by 25.3% and profit before tax by 25%. Dicadata also experienced a 22.4% drop in net profit. On the 30th of July this year, the company announced it had signed a sale and purchase agreement to acquire Exceed Group business operations around Australia and New Zealand for $68 million on a cash-free, debt-free basis. Dicadata believes that the acquisition would become the second biggest IT distributor in New Zealand with projected annual revenue of 500 million New Zealand dollars. The shares of Dicadata have provided a return of around 45% in the last year. The next company on our list today is Recon. It's a modern technology company that helps people and businesses change the way they operate. Recon listed on the ASX in 1999 and has provided dividends since 2012. Since August 2019, it's remained consistent in providing dividends. In the first half of financial year 2021, the company provided a fully franked interim dividend of $0.03 cents per share on the 22nd of September. It reported its normalized net profit after tax was up 18.6% compared to the previous corresponding period. Normalized revenue, too, improved by 2.4%. Out of the total revenue during that period, 88% of the revenue was from subscriptions. The company also reduced its net debt to $13 million, driven by the sale of its documentation service called Recondocs and also cost reduction. During the period, the company invested $10 million in cloud-based product development and is also planning to launch several new products in the second half of 2021. On the 13th of July, ASX-listed software company Novati Group confirmed it had completed its earlier announced acquisition of a 19.9% .9 interest in Recon. The Novati Group believes that this acquisition would open up new opportunities to discover synergies and provide growth for Recon as well as Novati businesses. The shares of Recon have provided a return of around 24% in the last year. It's time for a short break now, but stay tuned. I'll be back with more Stocks in Action. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, Dust up your passports, pack your bags, and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello and welcome back. I'm Rachel reporting live from Sydney. We're looking at ASX-listed tech dividend stocks. Adacel Technologies has provided dividends since 2013. They're a developer of advanced stimulation and control systems for aviation and defense. They listed back in 1998 and since February 2020 has consistently provided dividends. In financial year 2021, Adacel Technologies provided a final dividend of 3.25 cents per share on the 15th of September. 
The total dividend for financial year 2021 was six cents, up 140 percent over financial year 2020. During the period, the company's profit before tax was more than three times compared to financial year 2020. It increased from $2.2 million in financial year 2020 to $7.7 million in financial year 2021. Cash increased more than double compared to financial year 2020. And in financial year 2022, the company has chosen to alter its presentation currency from the Australian dollar to the US dollar. It expects its profit before tax for financial year 2022 to range between $5.7 million and $6 million US dollars. Adacel has invested in restructuring its business development team to place Adacel for long-term strategic growth. On the 23rd of September, Adacel announced the expansion of its subcontract with Lidos for the Federal Aviation Administration's Advanced Technologies and Oceanic Procedures Program. The New York Stock Exchange listed Lidos as a Fortune 500 science and tech leader. For the past 20 years, via its constant partnership with Lidos, Adacel has been helping the oceanic automation software of the Autonomous Test Orchestration Platform System. It has improved the operational effectiveness within the U.S.-controlled oceanic airspaces of the Atlantic and Pacific, plus the system's constant modernization. The shares of the company have provided a return of around 88% in the last year. With that, it's time to wrap up today's show. I hope you found today's show informative. Stay tuned for more news and updates on Calkine TV Live. This is Rachel signing off for now. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. October is set to be a massive month for Netflix with an enormous number of Netflix originals, movies and series being released and some fan favourites also finding their way to the giant streamer. And in this video I'll break down the best things coming to Netflix this October. But first make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Netflix Originals in terms of series, the big one is undoubtedly You, Season 3. The first two seasons have been a smash hit for Netflix, with Season 2 racking up 54 million views. The story about lovable serial killer Joe Goldberg is sure to go into overdrive when it drops on October 15, given the cliffhanger that Season 2 finished on. Fantasy drama series Lock and Key is also back for its second season of Supernatural Goodness on October 22. With season 1 focusing on the Lock children discovering they are the masters of the mystical keys, season 2 is set to look at the responsibility that comes with such power. How is any of this possible? This isn't a game. We don't know what these keys unlock. Evil thing. Who wants these keys? Another series to keep an eye out for is Made, which is dropping on the 1st of October. It's set to star real-life mother and daughter combo Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. The high-tension drama series is about a young mother who takes a job cleaning houses to get out of an abusive relationship, only to discover that more drama follows her. You are an emergency.
On the original film's front, Army of Thieves, releasing October 29 from superstar director Zack Snyder, is the clear standout. Snyder, who's been responsible for DC's Justice League films, Man of Steel and 300 along with a stack more, has created this film as a prequel to Army of the Dead, which was released back in May. Army of the Dead was praised by critics for its humour and action, and it amassed an incredible 75 million viewers in its first four weeks on Netflix. So those are the standout originals, but there's a stack more, including Call My Agent Bollywood, Dynasty Season 4, The Billion Dollar Code, Adventure Beast Swallow, and The Guilty amongst others. Third party content. There's some big acquisitions for Netflix in October. In the series department, it doesn't get much bigger than Seinfeld. Widely regarded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, existing fans and potential first-timers will get a chance to enjoy all the zaniness of Jerry, George, Eileen and Kramer when seasons 1 through to 9 drops on October 1st. The cult hit Miss Fisher Murder Mysteries also has its first three seasons coming to the platform on October 1. As for the films, there's some real standouts. The brilliant Castaway starring Tom Hanks will have you calling out, WILSON! It's being personally delivered by FedEx on October 1. Guy Ritchie's excellent gangster comedy, The Gentleman, drops on October 30. It features Matthew McConaughey as Mickey Pearson, a man with a marijuana empire who is looking to cash out of the business. He's also joined by a strong cast that includes Charlie Hunman, Colin Farrell and Michelle Dockery. There's only one rule in this jungle. When the lion's hungry, he eats. And last but not least, last year's super creepy theatrical release, The Invisible Man, follows a woman who believes she is being stalked and gaslit by her abusive and wealthy ex-boyfriend even after his apparent suicide. It's weird, it's creepy, and at times truly terrifying. You know what that equates to? A must-watch movie. And no, I'm not gaslighting you. Let me help you. You can't help me. So there you have it, the complete guide of content to help you avoid saying serenity now. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a comment about what other content you'd like us to take a look at. And don't forget to stay across the latest from Kalkine by clicking that bell icon. For more info, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm your host, Sage. And today's guest is Mr. Philip Ridyard, the CEO and founder of Straight Brands. And Straight Brands is a market-leading Australian premium vodka brand bottled in pure lific Tasmania and sold in domestic and international markets, proving that smooth, elegant and Australian can finally be used collectively in the same breath. And as you know, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And today we're very lucky to have with us Mr. Philip Ridyard, the CEO and founder of Straight Brands. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sage. 
it's uh, well uh, Philip we're keen to share your insights and straight bands is a multi award winning business most recently being awarded Australia's most innovative vodka and gin producer in the Global Business Awards 2021 congratulations what do you think is your winning strategy behind those continuous accolades well we, we were a pioneer in the industry and uh, we intend to be pioneers all the way through um, we've been around uh, in production since 2006 but there was three years planning under the radar before that we were the first premium vodka and gin business uh, in Australia um, we've always looked outside the country for our growth and um, we, we're innovators we uh, we were the first people to uh, screen print bottles in 2005 um, that had never been done in the spirits industry in Australia before um, we were the first uh, gin and vodka business to use seconds fruit that uh, was grown in Tasmania that had no alternative market um, we've introduced a successive line of products that uh, are uh, intrinsically Tasmanian uh, and market leaders in that they're all natural flavors Oh, sounds lovely. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And how is Street Brands creating jobs for Australians? We're about to open up Sydney soon after the lockdown and so many jobs were lost. I understand giving people a chance to work and earn their living is of importance to you, especially at this time. Well, certainly. Um, this, this business started because I spent 18 months uh, unemployed, uh, having been a uh, public affairs manager for an uh, AI6 listed company and uh, I was of a certain age and, and just couldn't find employment so in the end I went back to, to my roots which was um, at that time uh, 20 years in the uh, international drinks industry primarily as a, a journalist and a, a PR consultant and decided I, I needed to find uh, a brand, uh, a product and develop it from there, create my own job. Um, I spent 407 days out of Tasmania last year into the end of April this year uh, in lockdown in the UK. And um, as the, uh, the pandemic developed, I realized there'd be a lot of people looking for work. And I, I opened the box and Pandora popped out and um, I actually advertised um, for jobs, but not specific jobs, and an immense amount of talent appeared from nowhere, mainly in Tasmania. Um, a, a pool of people who, again, were of a certain age, or they were migrants uh, who hadn't been able to find work, and um, I was able to fit jobs around them, and we're, we're just in the position now where, hopefully, in the next couple of months, most of those people will be coming on board. And there are 21 people who've 